It's the Mixed Martial Arts Hour. It is Monday, October 1st, 2018, and Caesar is home. Welcome, everyone. My name is Luke Thomas, and this is the MMA Hour right here on MMA Fighting. Dot com. Thank you guys so much for joining me. I greatly appreciate it, man. We have a packed, packed two hours for you. Four in-studio guests, right? So let's go through them. Number one, Michael McDonald announced his retirement at age 27 after a career in Bellator in the UFC. He will be here in studio. He's got a bit of an announcement. He's the announcer and ambassador for Combate Americas. Alberto Del Rio will be here. Alberto Del Rio will be here. Uh, let's see. In addition, Michael Chiesa has a big fight coming up against Carlos Condit. We'll talk to him about that. Fresh off of his win at Bellator 206, Gagard Musasi will be here. And we've got other things to get to. A round of tweets, the sound off, the weigh-in. I'll be jumping up and doing the Monday Morning Analyst. How about that? You guys have been asking about that. Here we are. And, of course, you can interact with us at all times. You can do it two ways. Number one, you can send a tweet using the hashtag the MMA hour, and you may also call us 844 866 2468. That number is toll free. Yes, it is. Hope everyone had a great weekend. I hope everyone had a good time in Da Zone <laughs> watching Bellator 206. No matter how many times, I, I, I'll never normalize Da Zone. I'll never normalize it. Dumbest name ever. All right. But you know what? It was a good fight. It was a great night of fights. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, later in the show. Lots to get to, not a moment to waste. Thank you so much for joining me. Got your tweets, got your calls. Uh, we have to talk to our our other friend here on the show. He is the Arequipe to my pan, the arroz to my frijoles. He is the chambea to my ala, the one and only Danny Segura. Danny, how are you, my friend? It's good. You guys, good, yeah. Atletico escaped with uh, by the skin of their teeth. More, more like week. you were playing at home. You had the home crowd advantage. Injured. and Bale, nothing. What are you talking about? Bale was on there. You guys had your full ba squad. Bale is, I think, put together from, uh, uh, let's see, used cigarette Look, butts and banana peels. Now we'll see what you guys can do when we go to Wanda uh, for the second game. When is that? Well, um, that's probably down the line. I mean, they, they still have to go through the whole loop of yeah. uh, of other games, and then it will restart again. All right, so. but this is an MMA show after all. Uh, yep. Did you enjoy Bellator 206 on oh, Da Zone? I did. The, first of all, the Zone, and I'll be the guy who properly, uh, you know, yeah. pronounces the name. You're, tw you're, that 20, guy, you're 25. Yeah. You can get away with it. Uh, 26 now. All right. Uh, so, yeah, it was, it was pretty good. I mean, the quality was going in and out for, for a while. I thought it was my internet, but then I went online and a lot of people were having the same issue. Yeah, I was too. But, you know, with, with new platforms, all this is going to happen, you know. Uh, but overall, it was a pretty good experience, and the card was fantastic. It was an amazing card. Yeah, it was. Uh, Aaron Pico, I thought, looked tremendous. Yeah, I got to say, in the end. Unbelievable. In the end, people were like, uh, uh, you and I were the only ones in the MMA beat who expressed any reservations about the main event. And my position on that main event, Danny, I'll say it again, was – I understand why they made it, and you could tell the fan enthusiasm was there, yeah. and for those reasons, it was good. But as I said and you said, it's like, well, Rory's really well-rounded, doesn't make a lot of mistakes, and that the same can be said for Musasi, but there's a, a weight and size difference. You could yeah. see that plain as yes. day. But I got to tell you, during the Monday Morning Analyst, I'm going to show that's not the only reason. Oh, there were several other reasons for sure, but... I'll, I'll put it to you this way. Can any welterweight in Bellator do what Gegard Musasi did to Rory McDonald? I would say no. No, I don't think so. Uh, right. And, That's you know, point. Right. Uh, that that in itself, you know, sums up, you know, the whole weight issue there. And obviously, Musasi is very skilled. Let's not take that away from him. Uh, but we got uh, we got some other things to talk about, right? Yes, let's do that. So we're going to be giving away PFL tickets, yep. right? All right, how's that That's going right. to work? Explain that to the listeners. Cool. So the, um, the or, originally we had it for the best tweets and calls, but because we have such a packed show, we couldn't get to you know as many calls as, as we'd like to, and, and the calls were great this week, by the way. Great. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to open up the lines, and anybody around the New Orleans area that wants to go to PFL, we got VIP tickets. So uh, I believe you have the number. Yes. Uh, I wrote it down for you. Yes, you I can, have it. You mm -hmm. can give it out in a second. Yep. Uh, and you can call us, and it'll be first come, first serve. If you know you want to go to P PFL, just give us a call, and the MAR will hook you up. Yeah. So we're here. We're not going to be. Um, we're not going to be too stingy with it. Here's what I'm going to do, though. I'm not going to read the number now. Okay. The way it's going to work is before our guest Alberto Del Rio comes in, I'm going to read it then, so people have to watch through the whole show. That's how that's going to go. Nice. I, I like that. In radio, uh, we have a term for people who call in just to get uh, prizes all the time. Yeah. Do you know what the word is? No. We call them prize pigs. And what they do is they have all of the local radio stations on their speed dial, 
Yeah. And they just rotate until they hear a giveaway and then they press the number. I don't want to do that. I want to give it to a fan who wants to go and listens to the show. Huh, fair enough. Fair enough, right? Good. All right. I will check in with you a little bit later. Yep. Yes? Yep. All right, my friend. Thank you so much. It is time now, ladies and gentlemen, for the weigh-in. Man, can you feel it? Can you feel it? Can you feel it? It is October 1st, ladies and gentlemen, in five days. Five days will be UFC 229. Conor McGregor returning after a two-year absence, sort of one from combat sports, but two from MMA. He'll be taking on the reigning UFC lightweight champion, Habib Nurmagomedov. You know all of this. Why am I bringing this up? Not to reiterate the basic facts of the contest on Saturday, but to answer a question that everybody appears to be asking me, and I'm sure every other media member, and maybe each other, which is, is this really the biggest fight in MMA history? Is this the biggest fight in UFC history? Where does this, where does this really rank? And can we say uh, definitively that it belongs at the top? And I will tell you, in answering that, um, it brought up a couple of interesting points and observations. I'm not going to have a long way in today. This will be very short. You know, look, if you wanted to go back and compare some of the bigger North American cards that aired on television with Elite XC and Kimbo, I mean, the UFC on their early debut on Fox, some of the Strike Force shows on CBS, and you can get up around seven, eight, nine million or more, depending on how you want to look at those demos, those will be up there for observation. You can go back to the heyday of the Kakatogi boom in Japan, and you can look at Hoist versus Akibono, 54 million, uh, rest in peace. Norfumi Yamamoto taking on Masato. I think it did what 34 million. It goes down the line like that. I mean, is 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 McGregor versus Nurmagomedov really going to be at 54 million, half the size of the Super Bowl? That seems like a really big fight. I don't know the answer to that. Here's what I can say: that was 54 million just in Japan. That was a giant fight there. It's a totally different age. One thing you need to consider here is this is a really globalized sport today. People are going to watch in Ireland at 6 in the morning if they don't get preempted for Peppa Pig. Shouts to Peppa Pig for effing over uh, the Republic of Ireland in the UK. That must have sucked to wait up for that. But the point being is um, you can watch it in Ireland. You can watch it in the United States, in Canada, in Mexico, in South America. You can get it over the top. Some places have it in channel. You can order it online. You can order it on pay-per-view. South Africa, all the way to Australia, non-English-speaking countries throughout Europe. Like This is going to be a fight that just permeates the globe in a way where no other fight previously could. It just wasn't an option in this pre-globalized age that we have now. But that's not the point I wanted to bring up. And I'm talking like it's a pep rally for a reason. And that reason is back around UFC 100, you could say, well, I did 1.6, 1.7 million pay-per-view buys, and that's really big. But, you know, McGregor versus Habib will probably beat that. And I suspect that, well, I suspect it'll be the biggest pay-per-view in MMA history. But the reason I bring that up is because if you weren't watching the sport at the time, at the time, everything felt big. Now, that felt like really, really, really big, but MMA was hot. Everyone was interesting. It was water cooler talk. Everyone was like, is this the future of sports, and where is it headed, and how cool is UFC, and look at how smart the Fertitta brothers are and Dana White, and we have exhausted that part of things. You're asking this question in part because now we have tremendous highs and then a lot of lows. It's much more of a yo-yo than it used to be, and that's why it's confusing. It's like, is this really the biggest fight in UFC history? Again, I don't know if it's going to do 54 million viewers, but it's going to be damn big. It's going to be top five, top three. It might even be number one. The reason I'm bringing this up and the reason I want to start the show with this today is I am telling you part of the way it will become the biggest, if in fact it reaches that, is if this audience bleeds out and gets hyped for it. If you generate enough enthusiasm, I'm not saying you can change ultimately the dynamics of the fight, but it starts with you. There's the spark. It eventually turns into a roaring blaze. I fundamentally believe, even if you have had the downside of MMA uh, uh, way upon you recently, even if you felt a little bit checked out, I understand that this is the time to check back in. And fuck the bus incident. I don't even care about that anymore. The reason why you want to check back in is not just because of the return of a global superstar, not just because of its incredible stakes, is because this is almost as good as MMA is really ever going to get. Not merely because of the size 
of the potential fight, number one, number three, number five in history, but because of a guy trying an experiment of leaving MMA for two years and coming back. St. Pierre did it, but that's St. Pierre. Can he do that? Can he really have that kind of a run against a guy that dominant, 26-0, and in the best division globally where every organization has a good lightweight division? That is what is on the line come Saturday. If that doesn't get you back up, then it doesn't deserve to be the biggest fight in MMA history. But I have a feeling, ladies and gentlemen, that it does. And I have a feeling come Sunday morning or Monday morning, we're going to be talking about a moment in time in your MMA fandom that you not only will not forget, that you cannot forget. And I don't know who's going to win. Your guess is quite truly uh, as good as mine. But what I am saying to you now is expect bigness Lead the way by example with that bigness. Show the enthusiasm. And if it's been weighing upon you, MMA's challenges recently, shed them for a week. Enjoy this opportunity. Enjoy these moments. They don't come around very often. And then bask in the glory of what is to come, ladies and gentlemen. Will it be the biggest? I'm going to guess top three. We'll see. In the end, here's what I know. It's damn big and it's damn overdue. All right. And that's the way in. Now, many of you have been asking me when I'm going to get up there and show everything on the Monday Morning Analyst rather than having a guest. Today is that day, ladies and gentlemen. It is time for the Monday Morning Analyst. All right, here we are. Yeah, look at that. Standing up here like a hirsute Bjorn Revney, huh? All right, let's do this. Ladies and gentlemen, let me get this table up here. Where is the lid? Here we are. All right. There we go. Okay. So as I mentioned, one of the reasons why it took so long for us to do this is because the studio previously just wasn't built for it. it uh, they just didn't have the capability. And I'm going to go easy today. There was a lot of things I wanted to talk about from Saturday. I'm just not going to do that. But I am going to focus in on one thing. If you want to go to my screen here, that would be great. Uh, let's see if we can get up. There we go. All right. Now, here's what I'm not going to do. I'm not going to go through the whole fight because I can't. I'm not going to show you full highlights because I can't because the zone will get super bitter. So I, I can't do that. What I can do is I've got a couple of video clips I can go frame by frame on, and then we can uh, dig into that. So here's what we're going to do for the first time standing up here today. This is the second round. Now, in the first round, I would actually ask you to go back and look at how Gagard Musasi was able to land his jab. And what I want you to notice was the timing of it. Go back and look at his jab and look at how he was able to land it when uh, McDonald was between two steps, even before his second foot had placed on the ground, catching someone not on the beat, but on the half beat. Really, really impeccable timing by Musasi. But that's not what we're going to focus on today for the interest of time and the interest of space. First time trying this out. Here's what I want to get to. The Iminari role. The Iminari role is an absolutely uh, phenomenal technique. It was developed by a guy who goes by the name of Masakasu Iminari. You've seen it before. Tony Ferguson tried it against uh, Edson Barboza, got halfway there with it. And Rory McDonald has done it before as well. He did it against Stephen Wonderboy Thompson, although that did not work. The reason why we're going to start this uh, presentation here is because this is where everything goes wrong for him. You know, he was getting uh, out jabbed on the feet, but that's not the end of the world. Um, it sucks, but he was probably fine. But this is a little bit different. Here's what I want to point out to you, and let's look at this, and I want to show you what went wrong. Why, why did this Iminari role go so badly for him? A couple of things, and I'm going to go through this frame by frame. Number one, typically when you do an Iminari role, and by the way, like I realize I'm a man of, of, of larger size. I'm 6'4", I'm 275 pounds, so I don't do a lot of inverting. So when I do have to invert in class, I have to really go over the technique so I don't hurt myself, so I don't hurt others. I've had to really pay attention to some of the details. When you ever you do an Iminari roll, you actually want to typically start, not always, you want to typically start with opposite stance. Here, both are in the orthodox stance. That isn't to say you can't do it from that stance, but if you go back and look at the Wonder Boy fight, he was in an opposite stance. You go back and look at Tony Ferguson versus Edson Barboza, it's an opposite stance. And there's a really important reason for that, and it's this. Watch as he level changes. For a proper Iminari roll, this hand would need to come to the ankle, and this head would need to be on the outside of the foot. Never on the inside that I'm aware of. There, maybe there's a ver variety of that that I'm not, I'm not sure about, but for sure you want it here, right? That's what you want. Watch where his head goes. He grabs with the opposite hand for the wrong, and if you wanted to go to the other leg, that'd be fine, 
but he's going for the left leg, so you need the right arm. He's already too far apart. Musashi sees it coming, and look where the head goes. It ends up kind of in the middle. This is just botched in every way. He started it, I think, in a way that didn't make a lot of sense. From He could have switched stances. He reached with a hand for the opposite leg. He should have gone for the far side leg. He came for the near side, and his head comes underneath. Now, you can say, look, you know more than Rory McDonald. No, of course I don't know more than Rory McDonald. I'm not an expert. I'm just a guy who's been in gyms for about 10 years. I know things, but that's about it. Who's the guy, Joe, who does and says, I drink and know things? Is that from Game of Thrones? Something like that? Yeah, that's who I am. I drink and know things. That's it. I'm no, no more, no less. But the point being is, this never got off the right foot, li quite literally. He goes in between the legs. The head is supposed to go on the outside, and then you corkscrew around. That's how it goes. There's this guy, I forget his name. He's a uh, Eddie Bravo black belt. Um, I think uh, he goes by Decerberus, Decerberus on Instagram. He has the most impeccable, beautiful Iminari roll. It is absolutely exquisite in every way. And every version I've ever seen that I've ever been taught is the head on the outside. So he botches that in part because also he never, you never see him fake up here and then roll underneath. Never. He, he just rolled underneath. He just level changed from the wrong stance, went into the head inside. It just got off. In the, it, it, it was bad from, from the word go. So then... You see this, he has to just basically regard here, right? Which he does, okay? And that's fine. I have no problem with any of this. He just kind of regards. And I'm showing you frame by frame here. I'm not playing the video because Lord knows Dazon will, will be on my, uh, my ass about it. And then he goes and does a number of things. I'm going to fast forward here a little bit in the interest of time. This is an interesting one, right? So watch this. This is the Upa sweep he tried, uh, and it went nowhere. So watch this. And Upa sweep, if you watch the Kerry Melendez fight, um, the Carrie Melendez fight was interesting because she had an opponent who was literally sitting up on her lap, essentially, it, almost as if she had been turned over, she would have been mounted. You never really want to do that because if your opponent decides to force the UPA sweep, they can get it. If you resist and your frame is upright, you can get armbarred, omoplata, a lot of bad things can happen to you. You can get triangled. Ryan Hall's got a ton of good triangles from a fake UPA sweep or an attempted one. So watch, he, tr he attempts the UPA here. Plants the right foot, you see that? Plants the right foot and then tries to bridge over. Musasi reads it right away and shuts it down. Uh, just absolutely lights out anticipation, lights out. And by the way, the size difference there is really going to matter as well. So that's something to pay attention to. Let's focus in on something a little bit more as we move forward. And this is the beginning of the end. This is what I want to focus on. So the Eminari roll didn't go anywhere. He tries the Opa sweep. He couldn't even really... Opa sweep, you actually kind of want to be sitting up a little bit, and Rory was just still kind of angled back, so that wasn't going to work. Here's the last part about this. He starts in full guard. Okay, here's how it works. You can pass somebody when they have full guard on you from your knees, but it's much harder. you got to get on your feet. Typically, that's how you're going to break someone's guard. So you'll notice that's exactly what Musasi does, and the guard comes wide open. Now watch this. This was just absolutely exquisite. He's going to ground and pound here. You see Musasi... He is postured over, but he's got his weight behind him and under him, so he can be mobile. And I want you to pay attention to this. This was really the key. Look at that. See that? As soon as the guard came open and he attempted some kind of submission or whatever, he put his elbow and his knee together. Now he's created a blocking mechanism. If you wanted to, you could, if you could move your hips back out, you could actually sit underneath and do something known as De La Hiva. You could get in and make a butterfly hook, but putting the elbow and the knee together, now he's blocked. What do you think he's going to do from here? He's going to push that down, and he's going to drop. Look, he never, Rory can't get back inside there, right? What's he going to do? Boom! Look how he drops his weight, knee to the ground. That is textbook. Textbook stuff. What's going to win? His hip and leg driving down, or Rory's, what is it, adductor here? It's an easy call. The bigger guy. This is where a bad technical mistake, combined with recognizing that, combined with the size, just completely overtakes it for him, right? Just brilliant. Just drop the weight down, knee touches. Now you're in trouble. Now you're in big trouble because now one of the things that I really noticed about Musasi is his balance on top is good, and once he begins to pass, he doesn't wait. He gets right to work. He doesn't at all fuck around. So now look at that knee. Who's going to win this battle here? Easy, easy call. It's going to be the guy on top. And by the way, that can be also kind of painful. Watch how fast he passes here. I was blown away by this as I go frame by frame and not show the video to zone. 
Let's move forward here just a little bit if I can, just so he can delay. All right, he sticks the leg out free. Right now, watch what he's going to do. He's going to rotate. He's going to rotate uh, McDonald around. And when he does, he's just going to bring his knee with him on top. So he's going to rotate the hips of McDonald to a weak position. He's going to rotate his to a strong position and then just pop it right out. Watch this. He's going to walk him around. And by the way, look what he's got up here. I'll show you this too. Look at that. That's Look at the grimace on his face. Do you see that? It's almost like a head and arm triangle, except there's no arm trapped. Why is he doing that? Because if I can control your hips and I can control your head or your neck, you're fucked. You're not going anywhere, especially when there's a size advantage. This is what I'm talking about. Even if he's as good as him on the ground, technique for technique, the size disparity is going to be a big problem. You're seeing it right here. Once a guy this technical gets into this kind of position when there's no frame on the inside, <laughs> you're in deep shit. You're in super deep shit, right? So watch this. Now, he can turn a little bit, but that's pressure he's putting on him. Look at the head of Musasi buried into the mat. Look at the weight. Oh, God damn it. I kind of let off here a little bit. Hold on. If I can go back just a second. No, you know what? Let's go forward. Hold on. Watch. He's going to get up under the chin. He was making him look away. It was making McDonald look uncomfortable. He's going to drop his head. Watch this. He's going to drop his head. And now look at the pressure being put this way. Controlling the head, controlling the hips, dropping down like that. Now watch what he's going to do. He's going to keep walking his hips. See him walking him over. He's going to bring him to the weak side. He's controlling. Look at how hard that shoulder pressure is. The shoulder pressure is literally making him turn away. I one time had Bernardo Faria do this to me. And what he told me was, hey, man, <laughs> I'm doing a bad Bernardo Faria impression. He's like, hey, man, if it doesn't hurt real bad, you're not doing it right. And he always had that smile. And he did it, and I thought the top of my head was going to explode like a zit. It was so painful, super painful. And it's not just a pain that it affects you. It is immobilizing. So he's immobilizing him here. Weight is shifted down. He's got control back here, pushing hips to the weak side. And he's just going to pop that leg right through. Dunsky. You can see McDonald puts a hand up to stop it. This is quite futile. He's totally controlled. And then he just pops it out. Now, in the interest of time, I'm going to get through this a little bit. There are three basic kinds of mount. You can sit like this. This is the most controlling kind of mount. When your hips are this far back and you're dropping them down and you're sort of covering the body. But you can't really do anything from here, right? I mean, you can do pitter-patter punches, but not a whole lot. So what does Musasi do? He, can, he stabilizes position, and I want to show you this. Here he is, still pretty far back. Let's go through this a little bit here. Now he's bringing his knees up under him a little bit. So the three kinds of mount are here, here, and then right up underneath the armpits. The kind you saw, let's say, like Luke Rockhold, Chris Weidman, that would be like the highest, not, not like the highest level of mount in ranking, highest positional mount. So here he gets super high on the mount. Look at him stabilize the position. He waits. Now watch this ending here. I want to point this out. Where is he? Look at this mount. This to me is like just dreaded. This is such an incredible mount because it's high enough to control him. It's tight to his body, either underneath or against the leg, but the hips are far up enough to, to like weigh him down and yet far back enough to still be controlling. It's like that real nice middle space where if you're far back, you have to be down. If you're super far up, it's hard to get there because someone has to be like really hurt or injured for you to really drive up underneath their arms. He's got this nice seated position where he can do maximum damage and has really good control underneath. And you can just see, look, uh, McDonald can't sit up. He drop. Look at, look at Musasi. Watch him. Go back here. Look at this. He's down. Watch him as McDonald tries to sit up. Watch him drive his hips. Nope. Boom. And he's going to flatten him back down. Look at this. Just sitting up. Now look at this. There's actually space between the crotch of Musasi and the body of McDonald, but he's now anchored to the floor. Why is that important? Because if he's anchored to the floor, that allows you maximum position to drop bombs. When you're riding, you can't. When you're anchored, that's when you can just unload, which is exactly what he does. And this is when things just go back to worse. Then when he tries to roll, what does he do? Look at that leg. Look at that leg. Sneaks it up. Look at that. Inching up on the guy constantly, right? Always finding that maximum space. Look at the heels tucked underneath. Look at that posture upright, sitting far up. I mean, this is just 
an absolutely vicious mount. Now he sits back here to come on the mount to help control, potentially go to the back, right? Want to make sure he was doing it right. And then we kind of finish over here. Look where he is. Oops. Apple wants my password. No, thank you, Apple. Look where he's sitting, right here. Deep inside on the middle. I, I went way over time, but it's okay. Look at the ankles, crossed, like Rico Rodriguez against, was it uh, Kosaka, I believe it was? Just absolutely sitting up there, heels crossed, McDonald's sitting up, can't go anywhere, can't buck, and he's got, now he's anchored, because he, he sits up, he leverages himself, McDonald goes back down, he anchors himself, and that's when the punishment starts happening again. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, the size um, played a big role here, played a very big role, because in any kind of mistake, starting from that Iminari role, that was made, Musasi just took advantage of everything and then used smart technique as well as his size to bear down upon him. It was, in the end, kind of a mismatch. Great job by Gugard Musasi. All right, it's time. I think with the time we have remaining, let's do a little sound off. All right, donkeys. Now, we went a little bit over time because we were trying that out. Let's go to our friend in just a second. Let me get a sip of my coffee. Mm. I'm here. Never supposed to drink on camera, but I just did because that's the kind of breaking, guy I am. Breaking all kinds of rules. You know what? I'm just a rebel without a cause. Yeah, clearly. Um, all right, Danny. So here's what we're going to do. Let's, let's do this. Let's, can we stitch the video together after the fact? Yep, we'll do some yep. calls now. We'll do some calls at the end of the show. And then when the video, the sound off comes out on um, YouTube later on by itself, you can stitch them together? Yeah, right. that can be done for sure. All right, let's do it. Can we go to you now on the screen, my friend? Are you ready to be on screen? Look at that. And I am here. What do you think of my Monday morning analyst there? It was good. It was good, really good. I, I like the, the little Apple password. Uh, thing you know what? It's only the up. highest level of technology here yes. on the MMA Hour. Very if there's highest. anything that has been a hallmark of my career, it's the finest of things. Uh, all right, yeah. we don't it was have... good. I liked it. We should do more. You should do more. We'll of definitely those, uh... do. That was a bit of yeah. a test run, quite mm -hmm. quite honestly. That went yeah. a little bit longer than I thought, so we'll budget time a little bit differently going forward. All right, but with that being said, let's just jump in right to it. Calls, uh, uh, Danny. Let's do let's it. Hear him. So you know, big weekend obviously with UFC 229, but I feel like we do have to you know pay respects to Bellator. They had an amazing card, so let, let's talk a little bit about that okay. before we we do uh, the UFC stuff. So here's our first caller. Hey, Luke, man, big fan of the show. This is Benito Nelson. I'm calling out of Raymondville, Texas. And my question was, do you think that Gegard Mousasi is the most underrated fighter in MMA history? Hmm. And also, do you think he is the best fighter to never get a chance at the UFC belt? Thank you. I enjoy the show. It gets me through my day or through my morning commute to school. And uh, I'll be watching later. Have a nice one. All right. That's an interesting question. Um, yeah. Fedor is probably the best fighter to never get a UFC title shot, but I think what he's implying is... Um, I fought for the promotion. Right, exactly. You have to be yeah. in the organization in order to even qualify mm -hmm. for one. Exactly. So I would say he's probably up there. He, yeah. he is. If he's not number one, he's certainly in the top three, man. That is, that's a fairly easy call. That, yeah. that is a guy. He's so talented, dude. When I was watching him go through... I mean, I have... I have tremendous respect for Rory McDonald. I think those jabs he wasn't expecting, I think they yeah. kind of disrupted his his concentration, and that's why I think the Iminari role was off, and then from there, man, it just went from bad to yeah. worse. I think Rory thought that he was going to have the speed advantage in that, uh, you know, be, being the smaller guy, but, you know, Musasi's a pretty quick guy. And his timing. And, uh, yeah, his timing and I think that threw him off. That definitely surprised him. And, and I would say so, and it's weird because it's it's almost like a thing with middleweights where they, they fall under this... A lot of middleweights fall under, you know, best fight, UFC fighter to never fight for a belt. For me, it was always Michael Bisping, right? But then yeah. we know how that ended. Then you're Romero, and then now he's getting all kinds of title shots, right? Yeah. Uh, and now it's Gegard Mousasi. Sure. I, I, that has to be him. Uh, maybe TJ Grant, that lightweight. Yeah, uh, yeah. You, you know, he never really got one officially. Yeah, right? yeah. never fought. After the concussion, uh, right? Yeah. L but last thing about this, sure. when, when I'm, I've interviewed uh, Musasi a number of times, he'll be on the show a little bit later. He's told me, he's like, you know, I've had a number of injuries, and they kind of held me back during different portions of his career. And, and people don't want to hear it. Oh, I, I was injured. I'm, you're making an excuse. Yo, man, it's real. Like, look how much better he is now. It's obvious, true, obviously true yeah. that it kind of held him back a little bit. Cool. Well, let's move up to heavyweight. All right. We'll talk about that. 
Hey, Luke and Danny. This is Josh from Vancouver here. I was just wondering if you guys think Rampage Jackson would be a top 15 heavyweight in the UFC after uh, his performance this weekend at Bellator. Thanks, boys. That's funny. serious question, by the way. Would he be a top? Fi- look, I man, mean, hold on. Let's let's a good let question. Let me pull this up for the rankings. That's a really good question. I, I honestly feel like he might be. I don't think that's that crazy at all. It isn't. The number fifteen heavyweight is Justin Willis, who I actually think is pretty good. Then Stefan Struve, Arlovsky, Shamil Abdurakhimov, and Tai Tuivasa. I think those guys might wrestle him. In which case, no. But if they stood, could he be? Yes. Yes, he could. Yeah. Right. I mean, if, if they chose not to take it to right? the ground. The, I think the answer is yes. I mean, think about it. Uh, a fight between Stefan Struve versus Rampage Jackson. Yeah, it could go either way, yeah, right? Yeah. God, you know what's funny about the whole, like, oh, he doesn't want to fight a wrestler? Dude, Rampage used to have lights out takedown defense. Yeah. You ever seen the Kevin Jackson, excuse me, the Kevin Randleman fight? No. I mean, oh not on the top of my head. I've seen highlights. One of the sure. best prides ever was Pride Body Blow, which yeah. that fight was on. And that was the first time Fedor fought Noguera. Dude, Kevin Randleman, I mean, remember Kevin Randleman? He was an amazing yeah. wrestler and built yeah, like a brick shit house. Freak, yeah. Dude, he could not get Rampage down. Rampage had unbelievable takedown defense. Yeah. But I guess over the years, he just got tired of that. So, And also, he still does. I feel like, yeah. like a, a lot of the times people shoot on him, he stops it, but then they just stay in a stalemate, whether he's pressed up against the cage, yep. et cetera. Yep. Uh, you know, and that's not the type of fights he wants to be in. But yeah, so the answer to that, maybe. I think maybe, yeah. Yeah. All right, now let's talk about UFC 229. Hey, Luke and crew. Um, as my name is Scott Anderson, I'm from Boston. Um, like an Irish kid from Boston, I'm obviously pretty excited for this weekend. And while I'm looking at the, the fights, it kind of makes me think with 25 years this year of the UFC and kind of celebrating that, everyone's toting the Connor fight as the biggest fight ever. But my question is, is it actually the most important fight ever? And if it's not the most important fight ever in UFC history, then what is? you guys so much and enjoy the fight this again mm. so it's a great question everyone's talking about this is the biggest fight in ufc history which it could argue it could be very well be but what about the most important is it the most important so fight it's, in it's a loaded term because like what does yeah. important mean obviously i will right. tell you that it has like implications for divisions implications for greatness implications for careers and in that sense this is highly important mm-hmm. at the time i'll say this at the time the rematch between penn and saint pierre felt like the most important, the second one. In the end, it, be, it ended up being a bit of a wipeout. But heading into it, yeah. that one felt like, well, because if you've never seen the first one, I mean, Penn was tuning him up early, very badly. Arguably, could have won that fight. I would say that one probably was the most important, at least heading into it. But this yeah. one's pretty damn important. That's, oh, that's why it gets me. It's like, oh, the bus incident. Man, forget the bus incident. Yeah. There's so much more than the bus. That, that's that's why I hate the the promos that are going around. It's like it's all about the buzz, as if you know the buzz incident happened, and then that's why we got this fight. No, right. no, 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 no. There's so many other reasons why this fight so should be true. happening. Uh, but you know, back to that question. I think this is for the biggest. There's metrics, right? There's traffic. You know how many people are talking about it. Pay per view sales. For most important, I feel like it's a thing with time, right? Like, you know, Stephen Bonner versus Forrest Griffin. Like, yeah, that was an important fight. Sure, but point. we didn't realize the importance of it till after, right? Yep. Uh, so I think the same with this. We'll, we'll see what happens, uh, you know, a year down the line or, or a few It, it really depends on who wins and how they win. Right. And then what happens after as well, right? Right. Sure. All right. So now let's talk about numbers for UFC 229. Okay. Hey, Luke and Danny. Big fan. Um, my name is Dennis. I'm calling from a dump known as Bridgeport, Connecticut. <laughs> I do want to talk about the possible pay per view buys uh, for 229. There's a lot of people talking. Dana White saying possible 3 million. Um, some of your colleagues, former colleagues, 2.5, minimum 2 million. I just want to know your thoughts about that, your opinion on what you think we could be looking at. And so what would you consider a failure? Anything below 1 million? Anything below 1.5 million? Uh, yeah, just your thoughts on that. Um, P.S. Fuckers boring. Who? Yeah, I, I couldn't understand what he said there at the end. So, what, what say, something's boring. I don't know. I mean, if you're gonna have a zing, you gotta be intelligible, and it's gotta be clear, right? Yeah, it's gotta be clear. What good is a zing you can't understand? Um, okay, I would say anything below a million is a failure for sure. Anything below, well, anything you know, I would consider one two be be borderline bad, but uh, one five would be fine. Mm-hmm. Two would be great. Yeah, two point five would be incredible. And I'll go from there. I'll go in those those incremental um, half million stages. 
Yeah, anything over below a million, it's a complete failure. I mean, I would even say like 1.1, 1.2, it's like, eh, for the really the biggest fight in UFC history, yeah. like, not a huge failure, but definitely not good. Um, and then I would say anything above two is a, is a great success. Okay, I could buy that. Yeah. All right, now. Let's By the way, what is, what is your prediction of what it will do? Oh, uh. I feel, I'm, are you feeling it, dude? You heard me in the opening. I'm feeling it, man. Yeah, I'm not. No? No, not yet. See, you're burned out. That's the problem. This no, is, I'm I don't, telling you, this is affecting everyone's enthusiasm. I mean, it's interesting because I've talked to some people that are casuals and they're like, yo, you know, the the Habib McGregor fight. Like, people know. People know what's up. Um, but I don't know. I don't know. It's just like the amount of promotion. I think, I think once, you know, it's still fight week. Fight week starts today, right? Well, technically Tuesday with all the events. Right. Um, I think once I see the reception around that, then I'll get a good gauge of, of, How's it going to do? But uh, my guess it does. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll choose two. Okay, I'll go two, two. Okay. Cool. Now let's move on and, and let's talk about uh, the trash talk that's been going on between Habib and, and Connor. All right. Hey, look, Danny, this is Diego from Mexico City. I'm a huge fan. And with a press conference scheduled for Thursday, we should expect a lot of the same thing as the last one, especially now that there's going to be an audience. So. I want to know your opinion as someone from the media. Where would you draw the line between mental warfare and showmanship and disrespect and unprofessionalism? Because we know Connor loves interrupting and responding even if the question is not for him. And as a fan, I really want to know what both fighters have to say. And I find it really annoying. So I can only imagine what it's like for you guys to ask a question and not get a response. Muchas gracias y saludos desde México. Yeah. Saludos a Mexico and shout out to our international callers, wow. right? You can always email the MMA hour at voxmedia.com if you don't want to call our hotline. Um, so, yeah, is there a line between mental warfare and being outright disrespectful? There is no such thing as professionalism or any line about professionalism inside MMA. The only line is do you do anything to jeopardize the fight? Anything else is fair game and fair in the sense of it could be terribly demeaning and awful things to say. But I used to point this out. Ricardo Mayorga used to tell his opponents he was going to drink their wife's breast milk. I mean, I mean, we haven't even scratched the surface of unprofessionalism. You know, people, I mean, I, I thought Jesus. the thing is Connor's like stoking these ethnic and cultural tensions. Yeah. And we'll see where that goes. I don't know how good of an idea that is long term, but, um, but like, like it might in, I'm not saying that does, but I'm saying individual things I've seen may or may not bother me. But yeah. folks have had like, has it crossed the line? Yeah, of course. The fight game is about crossing the line. The yep. sport is about crossing the line. So to me, the answer is it's all fair game. This is one reason why there are, weren't fans of the first press conference because they'll be like, Connor, are you going to knock him out? And then it's ole, 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 ole for, you know, 45 yeah. minutes. Yeah. That's, and that's what we're going to get on Thursday, probably. Um, but yeah, I mean, and this is something I feel like Dana White has always gotten right. Uh, they've always asked him about, well, what do you think about this fighter saying this and this fighter saying this? And he goes, hey, look, this is the fight game. Yep. These guys are going to get into fist fights. You know, they're, they're about to fight. Of course, they're not going to say nice things to each other. It's nice to get, you know, some fighters to be very respectful, like the GSP, but it's the fight game. Anything goes. Now, the last thing is, what if someone called another fighter the N-word? See, there's you getting yeah, into Here's yeah. the thing. Like, um, mater there's materially, I'm not sure how much worse that is than other things. Although, let me be clear about this. It's absolutely reprehensible in every way imaginable. What I'm saying to you is that's one of those cultural touch points here that if somebody did that, there would just be so much outside pressure to knock yeah. that off. Then that's the case. Um, but materially, you can say really nasty things to each other without much of an issue. Yeah, there's definitely things that are off limit and, and, and things that I'm sure the UFC will act upon if they, if they do come up. But for the most part, not but, really. Yeah, there's very few things, though. So I'm going to leave you with this question, okay. and then I'm going to get Michael McDonald. Sounds good. Sounds good? Yep. All right. We'll do these calls also a little bit later in the show. Cool. Yeah. Hey, Luke. Hey, Danny. Uh, my name is Mike. I'm calling from the DMV area. Hope to run into Luke sometime over here. Uh, my question is... I'm a hermit. Do you think Khabib will get any of this rub from Connor if he beats Connor, um, Or do you think that, in a way, this could end up making him like a heel or making everyone hate him for taking down the kid. Thanks. Appreciate it. Well, he would have to win first, and there are no guarantees about that, right? If Connor wins, then forget about it. Although I still think even with a loss, if he performs well, um, he could uh, maintain some level of um, uh, extra popularity. So you're, you, you run into one of these situations where it's like, is this 
the uh, Amanda Nunes scenario with Ronda all over again where Ronda loses and there's no rub. That's that's possible, but I don't believe it. And the reason why is because Habib has already much more of a following both domestically and abroad than Amanda has, I think, in either of those cases, even to this point. Um, he has a pretty unique following in Russia. I think worldwide he's got a lot of fans as well. And here in the United States, you saw the Habib army show up to AKA and go bananas. And that's just a small group of guys. But it's indicative of, uh, I think, a larger set of people who are really interested in seeing him um, compete and do well who are fans of his. So to me, let's say he wins. And again, there's no guarantees over any of this. But if he wins and he wins dominantly, then yes, he'll get some rub. Will he, like, take McGregor's place as the world's biggest MMA superstar if that happens? I don't think so. I don't think anybody can take his place, certainly not right now. But can he boost his profile? Um, for sure. And by the way, if you're expecting to see me out in town, good luck. Your boy stays under lock and key, son. I'm not there. Uh, I'm not there. Uh, I'm not hanging out too much. All right. Let's go to our first guest. Man, we've already been through like eight segments already on the show. This gentleman has had a distinguished career in mixed martial arts and decided at age 27 he was going to hang it up. And I said, man, we got to talk to him. So joining us now on the phone is former UFC and now Bellator and MMA fighter Michael McDonald. Michael, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Hey, man. So let's talk about it. You announced over the, well, I guess the end of last week that you were going to be retiring from the sport of mixed martial arts. For the folks who may not have seen uh, the statement that you put out, what were the events that transpired that made you know that now was the time? Oh, man. Um, there was a lot. Uh, there, was a, there was a lot of stuff that happened. Um, one thing um, is I almost lost my hand, and that's, uh, that's, that's, that's a big, big part of it. Um, so as I, if I was going to explain them all, it would be quite a while. But that, that, that's one of the biggest ones is um, – you know, the, right after my uh, my fight, I had to be rushed to the to the ER as soon as I get back to the uh, to the to the United States. Uh, no, not you say this, this one. This one wasn't in. Uh, sorry, last one was in England. As soon as I got back to California, uh, we had to rush, rush back, and uh, the swelling was so bad I almost needed emergency surgery to not to lose my hand. But the problem with it was the surgery required was so difficult that only a uh, like top tier expert would have been able to fix me. So I, I either almost lost my hand or got surgery from someone who wasn't able to do it. Hmm. So you did get the surgery already, right? I did. Yes. And everything is okay. Yeah. Yeah. Everything uh, turned out well, so that's good. And so do you have, four well, functions? No, I'll, I'll say this, I'll say this, everything, everything turned out with my hand. Um, not with my uh not with my arm my arm did not unfortunately what's wrong with the arm um i have zero function of my left bicep whatsoever um so there was a uh, an issue um during the surgery um and i, I th we think it was the anesthesiologist deal um uh, not the surgeon that i had um that um i actually have zero ability to uh to use my left bicep whatsoever it's completely um, completely dead. So already my left arm is like half the size of my right arm. And um, so now it's been almost a month that I have not been able to use my left bicep whatsoever. So I can't open a jar. I can't, um, you know, get a, uh, uh, a box, you know, out of the, you know, out of the cupboard. I can't uh, lift a sheet of plywood or a cabinet. Um, nothing. So, okay, let me see if I understand, and, and neither of us are medical doctors, but, and I'm, I'm terribly sorry to hear this, of course, is the issue that, like, the, 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 the distal bicep tore off the, like, uh, is it a nerve issue or what, a tendon issue? What happened? You know, um, my surgeon, I, I talked to my surgeon about it, and he used a lot of big words and uh, told me a lot about it. He said that the way that this happened, he goes, it's still connected, um, but basically it's not coming back. It's not waking back up. And he, and he said, um, now, now, there are different reasons that people's muscles 
don't come back after surgery. But the, the, this particular reason and how this happened is about a one in 8,000 chance. Um, he, he said, um, my, my surgeon is a surgeon of 20 years and, um, he is said he's never seen it happen to any, any of his patients. So it's, uh, it's, it's quite a, quite a rare thing. Um, what happened? Um, good news is all recorded cases have recovered, um, that, that have been re- recorded in the medical journal, but, it's not a for sure thing that it comes back, but the odds are in my favor that it does. But um, just because it comes back doesn't mean it's not a huge burden on my life. Um, it, 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 they said on average it could take up to six months to to come back. So um, literally not being able to use your arm for six months, you know, and that, that kind of sucks. Yeah, that's terrible. And it's your right hand and your right hand dominant, correct? Or no? No, no, this is my left hand. Okay, it's your left hand, yeah. Well, wow, I'm really sorry to hear that. Well, I certainly hope that you make a full recovery, and if the medical science is as they proclaim it to be, then um, you probably will be, but I'm sure that's a terrible inconvenience in the meantime. So, all right, let's talk about this a little bit. I mean, I guess after that, you had to know that a professional MMA career was just not possible, huh? Well, it was... Uh... It was it was a lot of things. This was this was this was one of the things that really really pushed me over the edge and and, and really you know tipped the bucket, um, you know. But I was thinking about this for a while. Um, you know, I, I'm a I'm a follower of Christ, and part of that it, it, about about being a follower of Christ is having your priorities in order. And um, what that looks like in in my life um, is God says. I want you to serve the people who you've committed to serving first before you serve the people you haven't committed to. So, so first off, I've committed to serving the Lord first off, and then second off, my wife. And after that, I don't have any kids yet. We're, and then so because I don't have any kids yet, who comes after that is your immediate family and then the people who um, kind of flow outward from that. And, um, you know, I, I was feeling for a while that um, I, I guess my ministry or my life with um, with those most important things were, um, it, it, it's tough when um, to, to do that to the best of your ability when your life literally revolves around your job literally revolves around your job. You, you can't call in for a replacement. Um, I can't have someone cover my shift. Um, I can't say, Hey guys, you know, I'm not, I'm not really not feeling well. Or, or, um, you know, I have a family member who has a wedding or, or, or a life, uh, um, endangering surgery. Um, you know, can we get this moved back a week or, or uh, something that, that just doesn't, this is not the way it works. You know, show business must go on. And not only that, um, training, every day must go on or else I'm going to get beat up in front of a million people and lose half my pay. Um, so it, it's just, it, it was coming on for a while of, you know, I, I know I've given a lot to, to the, to the sport and I'm willing. It's not that I'm unwilling to do it. I'm, I'm willing to put in the work. All that fun stuff is great. Um, but I have committed a lot and I, and I, and I'm getting to the point where I'm like, you know what? I'm starting to, to wonder if I can keep my priorities straight. And, and, and I'm wondering, you know, kind of looking at my life and, and how much I've missed so far and being like, you know, as I'm continuing, is this the, the path I want to continue going? God, would, would you show me if this is where you want me to go? And um, because of that, because I, I, I was questioning, is this where I should be going? Um, and, and as a follower of Christ, my, my, my mission in life is to do whatever he tells me to do. It's not, it's not to, you know, go for what I think is going to have the most money, the most fame, or popularity, or anything like that. So, um, before my last fight, I, I prayed and I said, "God, would you show me if this is where you want me to be? If you want me to go, I'll go. If you want me to stay, I'll stay." And I said, "God, I'm going to pray for two things. I'll, I'll say, would, would first off, would you give me a hole in one?" I said, "I don't even know if I can ask that, but 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 if you could give me a hole in one for this fight, that would be fantastic. And I and I would know that this is uh this is your 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 first like, like goodbye and, 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 and a cherry on top of a fantastic career. I said, second off, if you could wrap up my, my, my contract with, with Bellator legally, morally, and give me absolutely no question whether I'm supposed to move on. And, um, the second part of this, my hand, almost losing my hand, I was literally in the most pain of my entire life, currently having no use of my left arm. Um, and it being a very big possibility that, um, I'm never able to use it again. Um, things like that. Um, 
it, it, it was just like without without question it was just like this is it's it's time well that's yeah it sounds like um but it sounds like you're at peace with it though yeah oh yeah absolutely yeah i i, I that, that, that part of that prayer w- w- was me saying god i don't want any what ifs i don't want any like oh man what if i kept going and and oh man like should i really be doing this now like like god god says that he is not a god of confusion so I got I, make me sure, make me make me have zero confusion. Let me be sure, and and and, and if you make me sh- be be absolutely positive, then I will I will change my path and I will relentlessly pursue it. Just just like how you you you, you asked me to you commanded me to, to to pursue my fighting career to the best of my ability. So, um, yo, know, he 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 made it one hundred percent clear that um, that I'm supposed to be moving on, and that um, that, that 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 the price outweighs the reward at this time with, uh, with fighting both for me personally, for my, for my life, um, just everything about it. Yeah. You're still so young. You got a lot of left life left to live. Uh, I'm curious by the way, um, did Bellator pay for the surgery? Yes. Okay. Well, and- it's not technically Bellator. It, it, it's their insurance. Sure. Yeah. Um, when you told them you were done, what did they say? Well, um, I only talked to a couple of people personally, um, and one of them is Rich Chu, and um, he's the, the matchmaker for Bellator, and he was very understandable. He, he, he understood perfectly um, why, why I said what I did. Um, this, is, uh, this is my fifth hand surgery in five years, you know, and, um, and like I said, not only that, I, only lo- I almost lost my hand. I have possible permanent damage, and... After the surgery, I'm not. I am not joking. This was the absolute worst pain of my entire life. That would not stop. It was like a, it was like someone took one of my jet parallel clamps that I use in my wood shop, and I just freaking put it clamped it down to ten, and um, and it was excruciating to the point where it, I didn't think it could get any worse. I was like, this is a ten. Okay, this, uh, this is the most pain that anyone could possibly feel. And I'm like, I can't get worse. And it got worse 10 times over. It just got worse and worse and worse over eight hours um, to the point of I was just pushed to the exhaustion of, 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 of the most excruciating pain I've ever been in my life. I've just pushed, pushed to tears. So I, I could just so exhausted of feeling this pain. Um, I mean, after these experiences, I mean, there's just, no, I, I, I would never want to even put myself in a situation where I have to do this again. This is, I'm, you know, yeah, you know it's, hard pass. You know, you know what's crazy is I know how tough you are. Everyone out, out there knows how tough you are. It sounds like these hand surgeries, and particularly this last trauma you suffered, it has, in fact, traumatized you quite understandably. Yeah, I mean, I, I've I've gone through it many times, but this is the worst. I mean, I, I mean, my, my previous um, broken hand, when I fought Peter Ligier in, in, in England, um, in Newcastle, that was almost a compound fracture first off. So that one, that, my bone was almost sticking out of my skin. That was, a, that was a pretty bad break. That didn't even, that didn't even scratch the surface of the pain that was involved in this one. This one was, I, I not only crushed, but shattered the, this bone next to my wrist. And, and that's, that's bad, too. If next to your wrist, any movement is just going to set it on fire. I mean, it was uh, the, the, the pain of this one was unlike anything I ever experienced in my life. Now, what's interesting is you have always had uh, the, the specific nature of it. Please make sure and I and the listeners and the viewers understand. You've always had a bit of a woodworking business. What is it that you do outside of fighting specifically? Right. So I have a custom woodworking business. Everything that I build, aside from from cutting boards, sometimes um, I, I can have a, 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 a that would be considered semi custom. Um, some of the cutting boards. So sometimes I'll, I'll I'll make like a, you know ten of a board and I'll pop them out and then I'll sell them or something like that. But um, for the most part, it's custom cabinets and furniture, um, and I can build both of them how they need to be. But um, cabinets are, are, are at high demand right now. Um, it, it seems like with the economy going well and, um, you know, every, everybody is wanting to, to make their house a little bit more customized to what, the, what they're, uh, they're looking to do. So um, I enjoy doing both. Um, I actually really, really enjoy uh, ingrain cutting boards. Ingrain cutting boards are um, the highest quality cutting boards on the planet. And they're actually very difficult to make properly. Um, so, um, that is something that's really cool, and if you make them properly, I, mean, I, I always say it's kind of like uh, if anyone's ever chopped wood on a stump, 
um, you notice as long as you're chopping straight down on that stump, that stump never gets any shorter. The stump only gets shorter when you start chopping at an angle. If that's because you're chopping in between the wood fibers, that's exactly what you do with an ingrain cutting board with a knife. It will never get any shorter. It will never uh, show any wear um, as long as you uh, um, are, are cutting properly. Um, then, uh, so that, that's one of the cool things I like making. They're very, very difficult to make uh, properly, and um, I've made a lot of those. So I, I do make some of those for uh, for uh, people to buy. Um, but my, the, the heart, heart and um, soul of the, the the real business is just um, just someone has a space, they have uh, something that they want, and they say, hey, this is a very difficult thing where I don't know what to do, and I help them find out what they want. I build it on my computer to uh, to perfection, to exactly what they're looking for, and then after it's um, after it's 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 what they're looking for, and they're confident in that, then I take their money, and then I build it what I built on my computer and install it. So I take care of everything from from design to to install on the uh, on, on on whatever someone could uh, okay. could dream of made of wood. So uh, we're running a little bit short on time, so let me make sure I get a few more questions in if I can. Um, yep. Again, I don't mean to be impersonal, but with your with your arm being the way that it is, will that affect your job? It will. Yeah, it does. It does affect my job. Man, uh, but if but if your strength comes back, you should be fine. It's the f- fair way to describe it. I should be, in theory. What are you going to do if it if it doesn't? <laughs> I know I it's know. a terrible question. Um, I'm so sorry to ask it, but I, I am curious. Yeah, yeah, I don't know. Um, I, I would first off say I, I have confidence that um, that God will provide. I, I do have a couple of job opportunities that, that even if worse came to worse, and I, and I was completely unable to use uh, my, my, my uh, physical body, then I do have some other opportunities that I could go. But um, I know God will, will provide if that if that's the case. Uh, your favorite MMA memory is what? Oh man, I have some good ones, um, but uh, definitely. Without question, my favorite MMA memory was um, after my fight with uh, Alex Soto. I got a I got a message from a girl, and um, turned out that I uh, turned out that I married her, and so that was uh, that was pretty cool. Is that right? Is that how you met your wife? I did. Uh, my my wife's father. So now now my father in law is my coach's best friend. And uh, we never met. She, she's a, a lifelong martial artist. She's been doing martial arts since she's two. She, she outranks me in martial arts. And uh, so we never met, though. Uh, she came to my fight to support my coach. And um, and then after that, she sent me a message on Facebook, congratulated me. And then I learned that not only is she a, she a dancer, but she's also a very attractive martial artist. And so I started flirting with her, took her out on a date, and uh, here we are. Wow, that's amazing. I'll tell you, my favorite uh, memory with you is um, I interviewed you at UFC 145 after you knocked out Miguel Torres. You just had <laughs> you just had this incredible youthful enthusiasm, man. It was really great to see. Um, looking back, you accomplished a lot. I know that injury w- didn't go the way you wanted. And, and as you mentioned, that Alex Soto fight and the aftermath was so great for you. But in fairness, do you have any regrets about fighting MMA at all? No, no. I, I currently I have no no regrets. Um, even losses, I, I I learned so much from my losses. Um, I, I learned so much about masculinity, about being an adult, um, uh, just about about success um, through, through these losses. Um, even even more so than the wins. Um, so, I, I I think it was an incredible learning experience. Um, I, God really showed it to me that it was like it, it's like college. You know, it's for, for a short short period of time. You know, I mean, I, I was I was fighting for uh, for 13 years. You know, someone goes and gets a PhD for 12 years. You know, it's basically what I did. I, I got a I got a PhD in in, in success and in hard work. Um, and I got I got a great community of people around me now, um, and uh, and I'm equipped to do my next thing with zero debt. So that's that's kind of what how God showed me this this period of my life is kind of like college. Well, you know what? You ended your career with a bang. You beat a really top guy. You did it rather easily. I know that some people are going to play the game of what could have been, but what it was was pretty great, man. So I will, I'll say this. Congratulations on a great career uh, for all its ups and downs. And thank you for spending some time with us. And by the way, if your recovery goes as planned, which, of course, we hope that it does, uh, tell the public because I'm sure they would want to know. Okay. Sounds great, brother. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Michael. Congratulations again. All right, man.
what a great guy that guy was, you know? It didn't go as well, 19-4 record. Um, that win over Miguel Torres, man, that was a big deal back in the day. The kid hit hard. He hit too hard for his own frame. All right, uh, we go from one guest to, uh, check this out. We're going to have, today's a big day on the show, because I did my Monday morning analyst standing up there. Uh, we're going to have our first two in-studio guests. Now, I was only supposed to have one, but I'm now being told we're going to have two. We're going to have the announcer and the ambassador for Combate Americas, Alberto Del Rio, and then we're going to have Campbell McLaren, a gentleman, if they want to bring him on inside. They're getting mic'd up? All right, this will be fun. Combate Americas, man, they're out there doing something kind of interesting. I remember uh, back in the day, it was BET's, God, what was it called? It was like um, Iron Ring, I think it was called. They were trying to appeal to a specific demographic, and maybe at the time, MMA wasn't quite ready for it. But I do think that they're ready now, and uh, the success that they've had is, uh, well, it's just been it's been pretty remarkable to, to witness. And I, I've said this before, man, it's not about, like, racial quotas. Oh, we got to make sure we have enough of this demographic. No. It's that certain demos are just rock-ribbed fight fans. And Latinos worldwide, certainly in North and South America, they are rock-ribbed fight fans. But uh, on the MMA side of things, I think it's still a bit of an adjustment and a learning process. And Combate Americas is out here trying, man. They're out there trying to make it happen. So I'm waiting to bring them in studio. Y'all are taking forever to mic, <laughs> to mic them up. Um, you know what? I'll take that opportunity to tweet. Ah, I don't really care. All right, I'll tweet out a little bit later. Oh, yes, yes. While we wait for them, let's do this. Let's give away the tickets to uh, the PFL that Danny had talked about earlier. Now, you got to be in the New Orleans area or be able to get there. But if you want now, call in, state your case, 646-809-0777. I'll say it one more time, 646-809-0777. That is your number to call. Go get them ticks. You know, also, I mean, is there a better place to be in the world than New Orleans, Louisiana? Shouts to all the folks in New Orleans. Uh, they're phenomenal. By the way, I mentioned on the MMA Hour, the gentleman, the Cerberus, who has the good MNRI roles. It's uh, Marvin Castile. Shouts to Marvin Castile. Maybe the best MNRI roles in all of sport jiu-jitsu. Just absolutely flawless. He is, he is tremendous. And if he knows better about inside entries, then listen to him. All right, let's do that. You gonna bring him in now? Yes, let's do. It. Let's let's bring him in. No, no, no need to wait. While I'm still good looking, please. <laughs> here we are. Look at this. Coming in here. Look at this. These gentlemen have ties. Mucho How gusto. Mucho gusto. Mucho gusto. Thank you for having Mucho gusto. <laughs> How are you, Campbell? <laughs> Luke, I'm very well, thank you. Have a seat, gentlemen. <laughs> Thanks. Campbell, how's your Spanish? Uh, mucho gusto. Yeah? No, I'm not learning. I am learning. Yeah. I can hear Spanish now. So am I. But I, I do know how to say Combate Americas. Yes. <laughs> I figured I should know how to say the name. Yeah, I've been, I've been, uh, I've been uh, waist deep in Rosetta Stone for about three years. <laughs> and it works. It works. My wife's also Colombian, so we I have, I get No, no, things. that's a better way to do it. Yeah, well. Colombian wife. Yeah, boom. but they, they crack the whip on all the mistakes. And, <laughs> <laughs> As opposed to which wife, Luke? <laughs> yeah, exactly. you know what? Well, I mean, welcome, gentlemen. Yeah, thank you. You two are my first in-studio guests here. I am very happy to have you. Um, there's a lot to talk about. Combate Americas. There's so much going on. Alberto, I'll start with you. Now, your role is, your title, correct me if I'm wrong, you're announcer as well as ambassador. Yes. What is an ambassador of Combate Americas? Well, I, I, I go places. I go all over the world telling people what Combate is, what Combate Americas is, and what we do here, what, uh, what Combate represents for the fighters and the passion, the love, the fight like a Mexican. We have that campaign. We, we can talk about it later. Uh, just explaining the people that doesn't understand what we're doing uh, and what Combat Americas is. How receptive is the message? Yeah, as you know, boxing is the king, it seems like, of Latin America for combat sports. But they do seem receptive to MMA, but it seems like it's a learning process. No, right? they're loving it. They're loving it. That was the general perception for some people. Uh, even some people working in the company thinking that the Latin countries were, were not educated when it comes to MMA, but the, the, the level of MMA in Latin America is amazing. And I'm, I'm really happy to say this because in the moment those investors, those, um, the, the, that important people in the company went to Latin America and they saw the, the high quality of fighters that we have, um, they were in shock and that made me really happy. Biggest amount of progress, biggest challenge, what would you say? <clears throat> 
Well, we're doing fantastic things. Uh, uh, our numbers are like up there. Like uh, we, we're, we're doing, we're doing way better than Bellator and any other companies out there. Yes, of course, we have uh, the, the 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 UFC uh, as a number one because they they've been around for for many years and they have way more money than us. But we're doing fantastic things where we we're beating the UFC in Latin in many countries in Latin America, especially mm-hmm. in Mexico. And when in I Spain. started. In Spain, yes. And when I started working for my good friend and boss, Campbell McLaren, <laughs> I was in Mexico and I was just throwing BS. And I said, we're going to beat the UFC in less than one year. And we did it in seven months. We no have way. better numbers. Uh, more people are enjoying what we're doing. And I think it's because they can see through us and they see that we really support the Mexican talent, the Latin talent. It's not For us, they're not just a pair of gloves. We, we really care for them. Mm. And... And that's where I, where I come in the picture. Um, I, of course, uh, Campbell is a, a super busy man. He's running the company, bringing more sponsors, more investors, getting getting the money to con- to help Combat Americas to continue growing. So I get that approach, that one on one with the fighters, to make them feel what we want to feel when you are a fighter. I was I have been in both sides of the cage, inside and outside. So I know how it is. When you're a fighter and you don't get the appreciation from the promoters or from the organization, and we have seen that several times, and and that's something that is not happening here in combat. How did it strike you to do an all-Latin promotion? I heard you talking about the Iron Ring, by the way, before I walked in, and you said maybe we weren't ready. There's no time anyone would have been ready for the Iron Ring because that show was total chaos. Oh, I see. Right? I mean, it was just out of control. The numbers were great. It was beating the ultimate fight. I was about to say, I, was, I, I thought I mean, it did The numbers well. did very well. But I tell you, it's so different. You know, uh, people ask me, uh, you know, it, where's your top uh, audience? What's your biggest market? It's really the U.S. I mean, there's 65 million Hispanics in the U.S. And now with our new deal with DAZN, we've got Gil Melendez and Juliana Pena and Max Bredo doing the English language that, commentary, yep. right? Mm-hmm. And I actually put my cell number out on the air on DAZN. I said, call me, let me know how. And I, I got a bunch of people called none of them. Wait, wait, you Latin. put your cell number? I know, they the... said that was a mistake. Yes. You're like, you know the rapper Mike Jones? He did that. Yes, I... yes you're like Mike Jones. <laughs> so what, what's, the, what's the worst that was going to happen? I'll talk to an angry fan. Is that the worst that can happen? But people were very supportive. And I think what, I think what we have to remember, you know, I, you know, launched the UFC. Of course. You know, I think the yeah. UFC is nearly perfect for what it is. But I think it's one version of MMA. It's not MMA. It's a version of MMA. And uh, Alberto talked about fight like a Mexican. I think that, you know, when I started with Hoyce uh, and Horian, the uh, Gracies, um, the only way that they weren't going to win every time was to bring in big wrestlers, right? And that was Dan Severin and Kevin Randleman and, uh, you know, guys that them. Mark Schultz, who was an Olympic wrestler, he wasn't necessarily yep. big, and they could counter the jujitsu. So the DNA of the UFC is grappling. Mm -hmm. And as Alberto knows, the martial art in Mexico is boxeo. So my guys, so the UFC essentially is grapplers that learn to strike. Combate is strikers who are learning how to grapple. So and I think in an MMA fight, there's three different fights. There's the ground, and in the UFC we know that pretty well. There's stand-up, and we all know what that looks like. But it's that one in between. Mm-hmm. between standing and and that's where it's getting interesting in combate because my guys treat the ground as defensively can't take me down if you do take me down I'm going to get up again mm-hmm. and that's a very different thing so when you watch combate if you watch combate you've got to see a difference because we have more finishes in our events and the guys typically try to finish standing interesting and it's just it's a different mix to it it's a different style of the sport you know what's interesting as well is that like the the organization appears to be from the outside looking in walking this weird line and a good line but it's a weird line right so like what are the most important rivalries in boxing it's mexicans versus Puerto Ricans, of course right yes but at the same time it's like an it's it's like this latin unity organization so how much of it is latin unity how much of it is let's get these colombians versus the venezuelans and have it go do you have siblings uh yes i do. do you love them 
Technically speaking. Technically speaking. <laughs> that, that's the answer, right? Everybody's a sibling. That's awesome. But, you know, a fight's going to break out. Yeah. All right. And, 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 and U.S. versus Mexico is yes. hot for us, too, right? I mean, that's fantastic. When And with Goyito and John Castaneda uh, next week, a well, week and a half week, in, yeah. in Tucson, like I said, the symbol of both countries is the eagle, Mexican yes. eagle. And the U.S. eagle. So we've got two eagles fighting. So that's going to be a very hot. And fight we're fight. united as as Latins. I mean, or as fighters. But what we're doing here in Combate is like we had um, Copa Combates, where we did like something like like uh, the World Cup of, of. We had the World Cup, the World Cup of soccer, right? right. And you know, I mean, everybody play the same sport, but they're competing for their country. They're carrying their country over their shoulders, and that's what we're doing, creating that rivalry that um, the soccer teams have. Mexico versus United States, Mexico versus Puerto Rico, Madrid versus Barcelona. We are, I saw your scarf. And a la, a la I'm Madrid. Happy. A la Madrid. Yeah! <laughs> Makes him happy. Oh, man. I'm not happy because we lost Ronaldo, Ronaldo, whatever I you know, are. I, I know, know, I know. I yeah, but that's how we kicked <laughs> off in Spain. We did a fight last year, Barcelona. That's right, you did an El Clasico yeah. for Classico them. The I, saw I saw that. Yes. And that is where we doubled our first time on goal, which is our Spanish partner. Okay. We doubled the UFC's ratings in what, Spain. One more question, because I know you got an announcement to make, and I want to get to it. The other one that's interesting to what me is... What are you is, announcing? Yeah, so, so Do I know about this? Something I've heard. Something I've heard. <laughs> Here, here's what I want to get to, though. A little bit. <laughs> Hang on, you have some information. Just, just to clarify for folks who may not know, because I feel like you were like on Fight Pass in 2016. Wow. Now... You're uh, with two places, Univision and DAZN, correct? In the U.S. In the U.S. Yes. We're and talking about Univ for our U.S. views. Yeah. Yeah. U.S. Yeah. Univision in Spanish, yeah. Univision Deportes uh, as well, which is the Spanish sports cable network, okay. and DAZN in English. Okay. And the, the, right? the first DAZN fight was Friday, right? Correct. How did it go for you guys? They tell us great. Yeah. I mean, it was a great event. No, I mean, like, uh, the, what is DAZN telling you? Like, They told us it was great. Yeah. You know, OTT platforms it's typically new. don't give you the numbers. But I'm telling you, based on my sampling, when I gave out my phone, yeah. seems like they liked it. Yeah, yeah. yeah it seems <laughs> like they liked it. But, you know, um, with Juliana Pena and, and Gil Martinez, you've got – Gil Melendez, I'm oh, sorry. Melendez. You've got uh, two UFC fighters talking about combate. And I think that's going to help the English-speaking audience, too. For sure. Familiar faces, UFC fighters, both Hispanic, of course. Right. Second, third generation is exactly yeah, what you're it, talking it, about. Exactly. So get the feeling. Know what this is about. I say salsa outsells ketchup because everybody likes Spanish flavor. Right. <laughs> it's also better for you. It's also better for you. Thank you. So that's kind of the feeling. It's not. This was built to take advantage of an underserved audience. Right. And a group of athletes who really weren't being recognized. What we're finding is around the world, e everybody likes us. I mean, this isn't just Latin America. Sure. This is real. Everybody's going to like this. Now, now, Albert, Alberto, I have been told that, uh, you know, you used to do professional wrestling. Uh -huh. You used to be in MMA. Yeah. Um, everyone knows you have a background in that regard. Um, but it, I, I heard a rumor that you have something to add maybe to that resume, maybe to that legacy. What, 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 what's up for you next? Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump uh, back in the cage or in the cage for the first time because la I used to la jaula, yeah, that's what we call it, the cage in English. Yep. Um, because I used to fight in rings in Mexico and in, in Asia, but never inside the cage. So for 2019, I'm going to be doing that. I'm going to be fighting in the cage for Combat Americas, mi familia, mi casa, and I'm not saying just... This because my boss is here and he writes my checks. <laughs> uh, I really, I really love this company, and as many people know, and you, in the, for the ones that um, don't have a clue about this, I'm a very passionate man in everything I do, and uh, and I have invested my heart in this company because they have invested their heart and money in me, <clears throat> and uh, and it's not just giving something back to the Latins and the company is giving back something to myself. That's how we started our uh, relationship, work relationship and then friendship. He wanted me to fight for Combate, but back then I was doing pro wrestling and I was um, doing other things and I wasn't that hungry for, for fighting again. And, um, you know, uh, the, the business has 
changed, the progress in business has changed. And, and for me, I know for others, they love the way the business in pro wrestling is going. But for me, it's different now. I don't, I don't enjoy it anymore. So Why not? I started. And, I, and I'll tell you, I, I don't, I don't know anything about the business. I don't watch it. So. Well, when when I started, in the, I fell in love with uh, with the, the the sense of uh, or or all the respect, the loyalty, the 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 being men doing pro wrestling like tough guys, and I'm not saying there not there's no tough uh, tough guys anymore in pro wrestling, but it has changed in a way that I'm not enjoying it anymore. And because I'm not gonna change the world, I'm not gonna change the pro wrestling business. And but I can step aside and do something else. I started investing my time and in other projects, and especially in Combate Americas, and watching these guys, these kids, these amazing fighters going toe to toe every single month, and now twice a month. Uh, it made me feel hungry about fighting again. Like like Sylvester Stallone said in the last Rocky movie, the beast inside the basement. <laughs> And believe me, I have a beast inside the face that I want to release. And uh, we started talking about um, money. Money has never been an issue. Campbell has always offered me fantastic amounts of money to. I was surprised back he didn't take case. it. Yeah, I, 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 I kept saying no, no. But uh, like now, it's not just the money. I feel I feel like it's the right time to do it by doing this. This, this company is growing in an amazing way. And you know, me being Mexican, being Latin, it makes me happy to see a product that, that is, uh, the, the foundation or the ones carrying it are Latins, uh, of course, behind the, with all the help with, from the investors and people with money, but the ones carrying it, to take it to the place where, where we want to take the company, are Latins are, and Mexicans. Are the fighters. Are the fighters, yeah. yes. And they're Mexicans or Latins, right? So, uh, with this, we could give the company the first pay per view in history. I we see. can. That's the plan. That's the plan. Have a big pay per view because I'm gonna be facing a former super champion, uh, well known in Mexico and United States. Who? And well, we he cannot have who. the name yet. He hasn't, okay. he, have, he hasn't said yes, but we're working on it. But, okay. but right. if we if we get him, it's gonna be a super fight, a fight that um, that all the Latino fans are gonna love because of these big names. For, for for all the Latins and also for the Americans here. So it's going to be something amazing that will bring that first pay-per-view for this company. We could do it, let's say, we don't know where we're going to do it, but if we do it in Mexico City, uh, and I'm not putting any pressure, amigo, <laughs> we do it in Mexico City. Hometown advantage. Hometown advantage, altitude advantage. <laughs> sorry, I didn't say that, sorry. Um, we could do it in, uh, like in Arena Ciudad de Mexico in front of 28,000 people. You can sell that out? Uh, two years ago, I, I, I draw 20, 28,000 people for a pro wrestling show defending a, a, war, a pro wrestling world title. And I draw 28,000 people. Just I go monthly. around San Antonio with Alberto and he gets mobbed. In New York, <laughs> he gets mobbed getting here. <laughs> it's different in Mexico City. Yeah. It's not mobs. It's yeah. hordes. Wow. <laughs> it re it's, a, it's, it's really different. So, so, so what's the plan? The uh, first quarter 2019? Is that the idea? We're targeting February. we got a couple steps to go. He's just, you know, really gotten himself back in great shape. Yeah, he looks yeah. like a ben. phenomenal shape. Uh, uh, yeah, has, uh, has it been a challenge? Because it, it's been like, what, eight years? Ten years. Ten years since you ten fought? Years. Wow, a long time. And ten years, and uh, I stopped doing wrestling and jiu-jitsu for like five or six years because you know, I was going to those... MMA gyms, and for them it was like a challenge to try to tap oh, me yeah. out. And yeah. you know, there's a pretty, there's a, there's a, there's really good guys out there, and they all went crazy on me. So I was like, hold on, hold on, I'm doing pro wrestling. I just have to, you know, look pretty and have muscles and stuff. So um, I'm gonna stop doing this because I, one one time I got hurt, I hurt my ankle, and I I was working. I, back then I was doing 260 shows, 270 shows per year. So I was like, and working hurt because I went to an MMA gym. Of course I had my dad, what are you doing kid? You're not planning on fighting anytime soon. So just focus on what you're doing right now. So I stopped doing that for a while. Now I went back to the, the Jiu Jitsu, the wrestling. As you know, my background is amateur wrestling. So sure. I'm enjoying so much going back there with those guys and, and um, you know, getting back in, in fighting shape, but at the same time passing some of my experience to, to the young wrestlers. It's, it's pretty cool. It's a pretty cool atmosphere every time I go to the gym. And, and now I'm having my little son, Joseph. Joseph, Papa loves you. Um, he's doing it with me. 
It's like, you know, I, I, I always said, I don't want my son to be a wrestler, to be a fighter, but that's what he enjoys. Now, he enjoys punching people and throwing people around. Is this a one and done, or you think you got a few fights in you? I think it's just one and done. We, we're talking about maybe a... <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll see, but we, 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 we were talking about... I'll be happy with one. Uh, 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 I at, don't know. At that time. You know, that's what I said for my first MMA fight. You know, I was doing $50 per wrestling match at the time. Then Mr. Saeki came from Japan and was, hey, here's 25000 Will you fight King of Watanabe? And I said, for $25,000, I go in a boat to yeah. Japan and I, I will kill King of Watanabe. And then I, and I, and I remember me in the lock, myself in the locker room saying, I'm telling my dad, is this one and, that, and I'm done. And then, you know, he, Saiki came after the fight, the, the fight I won, in, I won in the first round, and he was like, okay, here's 50. Do you do another one? Of course, yes. <laughs> and keep bringing the, yeah. I see what you mean. So we'll see, man, we'll see. Well, you we'll know, it's, it's incredibly exciting. I have to ask, I've always wondered, I, again, I don't know anything about the pro wrestling business, you have to forgive my ignorance. Yeah, don't worry. But the name, Dos Caras, Two Faces, where does that come from? Well, it was, um, uh, they, they, there was this this um, pro wrestling magazine in the in the sixties and seventies in Mexico, and they used to create our uh, our superheroes. That's how my uncle Mil Mascaras, uh, the Mil Mascaras name was born, Santo Blue Demon, because here in America you guys had all those superheroes, and Mexico wanted to have their own superheroes. So the luchadors, the wrestlers, were the first superheroes for Mexicans. That's why that's where the mask came from. Also for the Aztecs and Mayans that they used those masks right. to go to battle. But um, but it was that sense of creating a superhero. What what made Valente Perez, that's, that was his name, the one who created that magazine, to come up with the idea and create those fictional characters that later on came came to life with my uncle Mil Santo Blue Demon and my dad Dos Caras. And he was, uh, but to pick the name of Dos Caras, he was the audience, he was the fans picking that name. Mm. They were like, we, they presented my dad, okay, here we, we, here, here we have this amateur, former amateur wrestler, uh, f former bodybuilder, he's gonna be one of the biggest stars in Lucha Libre, Mexican Lucha Libre, pick the name. And they threw a bunch of names and the Dos one Caras. winning was Dos Caras. Yeah. Crazy. Well, Dos Caras is still in real shape too. I was gonna offer him a fight. No, but I, 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 I won't fight my son. dad. <laughs> <laughs> not, not just no, no, because no. he's my dad, he'll kick my ass. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, I wish we had more time, but we have a tight schedule today. Let me just say this. Congratulations on your comeback. Thank you. I'm man. looking forward to seeing it. If folks want more information about Combates, where do they go? CombateAmericas.com. All right. When's your next show? And it's Combat with an E on the end. Yes, combat with an E on the end. America with an S on the end. <laughs> means the Fighting Americas. That's all. And, and, and uh, when's your next, next show? Next show is a week from Saturday in Tucson. All right. Then we're in Guadalajara, Monterrey. Fresno is our Copa Combate. So that's the big eight country. One night, eight-man tournament. Who okay. else is doing that? Nobody. Luke, nobody. You're out there innovating. You always have been, Campbell. Congratulations Thank on your success. You. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Gracias. All right. Let's do this. We have to go to another guest, do we not? Who do we have here? Yes. Is he on? Danny? All right, we're working on it. Um, Thanks very much. Yes, of course, gentlemen. Thank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Next time you're in town, well, I'll, put a, I'll give you a, a ton of time, I promise. <laughs> we're, just, we're on a tight schedule. This is great. And thanks for remember the Iron Ring. Yes. Hey. People hated that show, Lou. Yeah, people, are, people are racist. I mean, that's just the reality. What do you want me to tell you? <laughs> <laughs> it just is. It just is. All right, uh, we're waiting to get a uh, hold of Michael Chiesa. He's got a big fight coming up uh, against Carlos Condit. I'm very excited to talk to him about that. Big thanks to those gentlemen. If you've not seen any of the Combate Americas, um, give it a look. They do good stuff. And it's one of the few promotions out there that's doing something a little bit different, trying things a little bit different, and making some headway uh, all along. Well, we are putting our cameramen to work today, huh? Up there doing the, uh, the analyst, bringing in the in-studio guests. You guys, look, you're a bunch of union laborers, lazy, and I'm finally getting all that dollars that Vox wastes on you. <laughs> getting, getting, uh, you know, finally sweating out here for once, huh? You're welcome. You're welcome, boys. That's what I have to say. All right, coffee time. Joe, you're welcome, buddy. <laughs> It's the most work you've done on this show ever, right? It's true. <laughs> it's hilarious. Now, we're trying to get a hold of Mr. Uh, Michael Chiesa. We'll see how this goes. Um, 
You know, the good news about the sound off is that if one of our guests, I'm not anticipating this, I'm just saying, if one of the guests duffs or something, uh, you know, just go back to that, you know, just cover for it. It's great. Nothing wrong with that. Um, all right, so hopefully we can get a hold of him here. I am excited about this big fight, Carlos Condes, and taking on Michael Chiesa. Michael Chiesa, of course, jumping up a weight class. This will be at 170. By the way, that UFC 232 card, let's look at that here for just a second while we are in limbo. And who do we have here? UFC 232. So far, it's Cyborg versus Amanda Nunes. Ilir Latifi versus Corey Anderson. Ooh, that's a bit of a sleeper. Jessica I taking on Sajara Eubanks. We had him on the show before. Ryan Hall taking on BJ Penn. The Combate Americas commentator, Gilbert Melendez, Arnold Allen. Interesting. And then Michael Chiesa taking on Carlos Condit. Now, there might be some other ones in the works. They might add, because this is that December 29 card, yep, at T-Mobile, they might add John Jones to that card. If they add John Jones versus Guftison to that card, I mean, you know, it's just it's just the, it's just the best thing since sliced bread. So, so pretty decent card actually. I'm very much looking forward to that. Um, I was surprised by that Larry Latifi Corey Anderson fight. Not that they made it, but I, I, man, that must have fallen under the radar. I completely don't remember that. Hey, real quickly, man, while we're waiting, because they were talking about the zone, I wonder how everyone's the zone experience was. I have a hard line that runs to my laptop tower. That tower is the same one that I do my YouTube shows on at home, where I can stream in 1080p, um, 60 frames per second, and I get like, it's a gigabit speed, so it's like 900,000 download, like 40, 50 uh, upload, so plenty of bandwidth, and I, my app was getting chewed up a little bit. Now, that's not the case for the week before, for Bellator 205 on that Friday, it was fine, and then for Joshua Pavetkin, it was okay. Like it would go from like HD to SD and then back to HD, but for Bellator, it was straight up where it was Bruce buffering, where you know what I'm talking about, where and I'm to play on words, but where the arrow in the middle is winding. Um, it was not a great experience. Now again, it's a brand new app. You have in a brand new service. I'm not expecting this to be a prolonged issue, but I saw folks in the UK talking about this new deal that the UFC has with something called Eleven Sports. Now I don't live in the UK. I don't understand. Uh, all the various issues that you guys do. I'm not telling you you don't have a reason to bellyache. What I am saying is one, one of the common complaints was, well, we're not going to be able to record it. Again, I don't know how 11 works. I'm not telling you you don't have a right to complain. If it's not, if it's upsetting for you because hey, it's extra money and you're at, now you have to add cables and wires and a Chromecast, I'd be mad too. What I am saying is, though, if they're not providing DVR functionality in the app, I would riot. I would riot before I allowed that to happen. So, um, I don't know what that's about. You know what? Let me, uh, let me text some folks, see if we can get old Mr. Kiesa on the air. Danny, any update? No update? Well, we might be talking to him. No, no good yet? Why don't we do this? Why don't we do a round of tweets while we wait? Do you have five minutes to give or not? All right. Look, you know what? How about this? Put, a clock, put, the, uh, put the clock up. No more, no more just bantering about. Let's do a round of tweets, ladies and gentlemen. Let's get, that, let's get that thing fired up here. All right. Here we go. Count them down for me, please. As soon as that clock starts ticking, I'll start talking. Here we go. Who's Peppa Pig's <laughs> next opponent? Oh, God, I felt so bad. I felt so bad for you Brits. That is, and then, of course, the Irish, too. Oh, that sucked, huh? Can you believe that? It was right at the main event, too. I Dude, if I was staying up till 6 a.m. watching Bellator, and they did that, your boy would be livid, super livid. Um, yeah, that was a huge, huge error. They need to, and then apparently there's a law. If you do that at 6 a.m., but apparently no one knew that was a law, and that's never happened for a UFC fight, so God only knows what that issue is. Next. Uh, what was the determining factor, size or skill, in McDonald versus Musasi? Um, it was this. I still think, skill-wise, McDonald is basically as skilled as Musasi, more or less. I mean, you could quibble with certain areas. Um, one's more than this, and the other one's more than that. But what I would say is that wasn't a great performance from McDonald. I think he made a lot of errors. And what happened was, as I showed in the Monday Morning Analyst, it was errors that McDonald made that were 
not only was Musasi able to take advantage of them, even if they were the same weight, he was then able to bring his size to bear to make those mistakes even more costly, right? So it was a little bit of both, obviously, but it, it, I, I also don't think, like, if they did that fight again, I don't, I don't think it would actually look that way. I think McDonald would be a little bit better. I just don't think he ever got out of first gear. And that's a credit to Musasi for pumping that jab right in his face. But uh, it's a little bit of both is quite the answer, but more about taking advantage of someone else's mistakes. There you go. Uh, okay, do you feel that it's a matter of time before a current UFC champion jumps to Bellator? You mean like while they're a champion? That might be difficult given championship clause unless they ultimately give it up or they get stripped or something. Do you feel it's a matter of time? Well, you know what? What's kind of interesting is there's a rumor going around that the um, that DAZN is, pay- da Zone is paying Bellator $5 million a show, right? I mean, that's a significant amount of money. If I was a champion and I was making pay-per-view points, but my pay-per-views were selling – you know, not enough to trigger the various tiers that ultimately return money to me, I would consider a flat fee like that a little bit more interesting. Um, Well, it depends on what they want. Do they want to make a lot of cash or do they want the status and visibility that comes with being a UFC fighter? And the UFC fighter also, of course, you know, there's still an opportunity to make a bunch of cash that way as well. But um, my hunch is that if the right circumstance is there, and we're talking about a lower weight division where they don't necessarily draw on pay-per-view, it could happen. I wouldn't put it as likely. 30, 40% maybe at the best case scenario. Next. Uh, do you think Woodley would have fared better than Rory did against Musasi? Do you think Woodley would have fared better than Rory did? Uh, who would you favor in that matchup? Yes. But again, let me be very, very clear about that. That was just a bad performance from Rory. I think he could do better in another one. He might still lose. People are like, are oh, you saying he would beat him a second time? Well, maybe not. But do I think he can perform better than that? Do I think he can do an Imanari role? With his head on the outside? Yeah, I do. I, abs- I absolutely think that. I saw him do it against Wonder Boy. You saw him do it against Wonder Boy. It's absolutely possible. So, so yes, I do think he could have fought better. And I think Woodley probably could have fought better. But Musasi is just really good about, number one, as I mentioned, taking advantage of mistakes. And, you know, the first Uriah Hall fight notwithstanding, uh, he's pretty good about staying out of trouble, too. Um, I would still favor him. Dude, Musasi is really good. He's really, really good. I would favor him. Next. Any chance that Nick Diaz 209 is brought back for UFC 230? Seems like an impossibility at this point, but God, wouldn't that be awesome having both Diaz brothers fight on the card? Yes, please. Next. Uh, is the UFC missing big promotional potential by not having Ferguson and Pettis at the Fight Week presser? No. Luke, please <laughs> please unblock me, Luke. All right, Danny, save his address. I'll unblock him after the show. Um well, here's the deal. No, the presser should be about what it's about. There's a waste of time to have those guys up there. But I like what the UFC is doing. They're giving Ferguson and Pettis their own workout earlier in the week. I think that's great. I love it. I love the call. It's a fight that deserves to get magnified. It's two fighters who deserve to get magnified. It's an opportunity for the press to really focus in on something early on and not be distracted later. Smart call by the UFC. Good job by them. Next. Uh, I'm currently paying $99 a year on Fight Pass, $9.99 a month on DAZN, DAZN, $9.99 a month on ESPN. No, you're not. You're paying $4.99 a month there, $49.99 a month on PS View. Add in a few pay-per-views and my streaming budget is tapped. Are you hearing any similar complaints from fans? Are fans getting squeezed too much? Can I ask what you pay? So I would pay, I say, uh, whatever it is for Fight Pass, I pay that $10 a year, or $10 a month, sorry. So that's uh, $120. I pay for DAZN, so that's $240 a year. Right. And then I pay another five for ES. No, I paid the 50. So that's 250 a year. And then for pay per views, uh, I usually have a friend over and we split those sometimes. So, uh, I don't use PS View though. Um, but I also do YouTube TV, 35 a month. And I think that's about it. I got rid of who, um, I got rid of, um, Sling. Um, it's a lot, but with the, the idea behind the zone is to get rid of pay-per-view over time. And here's what I would say about UFC fans. We're in this stage now where the UFC is trying to keep their old contract. We're going to have 30 fights and then we're going to have 12 pay-per-views and we're going to have 42 a year. And we're going to have those 12 prelims on ESPN. I don't see that lasting. I don't see how that's possible. You mean to tell me four years from now, five years from now, you're still going to be having a, a pay-per-view a month. That seems terribly unrealistic. I don't buy that even a little bit. So uh, I would say we're in this transition period where 
the streaming services that are designed to take over and uh, eliminate the need for pay-per-view, it's still in this introductory beta phase, and we're sort of living in two worlds at once. Once that is fully uh, a part of how television is consumed, this will be less of an issue. Uh, hey, Danny, I'm going to send you a number. It's a, it's a bit late now, but we can try him. Um, and then you can call this number, all right? Yeah, I know. It's going to make it a little hard. But just try this. Maybe we can get, you know, if we can get five minutes out of him, <laughs> it might be all right. But I, I just sent it to you on Gchat. All right. Hopefully we can get that to work. We can at least, we can put maybe push Gegard back a little bit, like 145 or something. And so that way we can have a little enough, enough time with him and then uh, we can stitch it all together. All right. So we're hopefully going to get a hold of Mr. Chiesa. It's live. It's live show, folks. What do you want me to do? You know what I'm saying? That's why you got to take matters into your own hands. You got to do your own Monday morning analyst. That's what I'm, and by the way, about that, I'm happy to bring back a guest. Like, you know, when Dan Hardy comes on, you know, you got to, you got to give the floor to Dan Hardy. When Dominic Cruz comes on, same kind of thing. But uh, week in, week out, it's just been a challenge to figure out how to do that. I know it sounds obvious. You just hook a laptop up to a TV, but it's a little more complicated than that. Um, but uh, I got an email already. People seem to be sized for it, so we can make that work. All right. Ah, Danny, any luck? <laughs> it's fun. Fun having to tap dance here. I'm live on air. Hey, you got the tickets are gone? All right, look at that. You know what? You're welcome. You're welcome, cameraman. Got there, earning that check. Uh, enjoyed the PFL show as well. That should be kind of fun. I mean, it's hard to go wrong in New Orleans. Man, you could just wake up in the gutter in New Orleans, and I'd be psyched to do that, right? I mean, it's pretty great. <laughs> there's there's almost nothing wrong with New Orleans. I mean, below being below sea level kind of hurts, but if you've never been there, you know who went there recently? Have you guys ever seen Arsenal Fan TV? I guess Arsenal fans worldwide have some kind of yearly pilgrimage to some festival. And this past year, it was in New Orleans, and all the Brits seeing New Orleans was hilarious. They're like, this place rocks. Again. Yeah. Yeah, New Orleans is the shit. It's pretty great. Um, what do we think, Danny? Is this going to happen or no? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's done. Let's just scrap that. Why don't you come back on the phone, uh, the screen here? Let's take a couple more calls because that ain't going to happen. You know what I'm saying? Like, we got a window, bro. We got tight windows, man. If we were on to, like, four or five, we could just play with this a little bit. Yeah, but... if, we, if we could, you know, we had so much time to schedule stuff, you know. But your boy, easier, your but... boy has to, as soon as the show is over, I got to go uptown. I got to do three more hours of radio, dog. Fun. You seem excited, right? Uh, it's, the, it's the worst part of my day. <laughs> <laughs> Don't get me wrong. I like the job. Is that what I mean? Yeah. It's like when you're done with, it's like the MMA hour is over and I now have to go gear up for the Luke Thomas show. Yeah. It's a very different show, by the way. Bro, it's hard, man. You got to like, I drink, difficult, man. I drink yeah. enough caffeine to kill the elderly. Honestly, if I was 10 years older, I would have a heart attack. That's how much coffee I drink. We got 10 years of the MMA hour, right? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to die. I'm going to have, I'm going to have. Like, I, would say, I, I would say less. I'm a bit pessimistic. Yeah, I'm going to have an, you know, the, the rate I drink coffee, I'm going to have an, I have to literally drink. Can we just pull back the curtain? Why not? Why are we doing this phony bullshit? Before the show, Danny, here's what I have to do. Yeah. I have to drink Pepto Bismol, mm -hmm. don't I? Yes. So that I've seen it with my own. So eyes. that my rear end doesn't explode. <laughs> and the reason why is because I drink enough coffee to honestly, it's like, it's like, you ever seen that scene? You ever seen Dumb and Dumber? The scene yeah. where Lloyd Christmas spikes the, yes. uh, and then the dude ha sits there like that. Yeah. yeah, yeah. If it was. <laughs> If it wasn't for the Pepto Bismol, that would be oh, me God. in this chair. You understand? Yeah. All right. This is this is the point where viewership drops. Yeah. Bathroom um, humor. Everyone yeah. asked for it. They're like, you know what the MMA hour needs? Bathroom humor. Yeah. Um. So we got a few minutes to kill before Mr. Musazi comes on. You want to take on a question? Yeah. Let's do it. All you right. Stitch this together. Yes. Yes. Right. Uh. This will be all together. It'll make sense. So you saw the big news came out, right? That now they're no saw longer going to announce uh that. potential uh, violators, right? Yep. Um, so we have a question about that. Let's hear it. Hi, Luke and Danny. This is Rahul from Mississauga, Ontario, Canada. Uh, USADA has apparently started to not release possible violations until after they conclude their investigation. 
Uh, for a fan like me, I think this is a good thing because of how fighters are generally prosecuted in the court of public opinion whenever they fail a test like a uh, Yoel Romero or a Josh Barnett or a Tim Means. But on the other hand, could this be a bad thing where the UFC basically kind of strong arms USADA into not releasing positive results and prosecuting a certain fighter if that fighter is, you know, big business for them, like a John Jones or a Brock Lesnar or even a Conor McGregor? All right, so I'm going to stop it right there. So good question. Um, basically asking what are your thoughts on, 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 you know, this whole USADA thing where they're not going to release any more names uh, until, you know, everything's sorted out. Okay, good question. Here, here's my answer. My answer is that I am massively in favor of it. Mm -hmm. I think it's absolutely the right call. Um, athletes are entitled to privacy. I don't know yeah. why this is a controversial idea, but it appears to be for some. Uh, I, again, it's not, it's not, I, I'm not, I don't understand why. Um, but here's the reality. Anti-doping and privacy, uh, they can coexist, but they are constantly within tension. Um, the more privacy you have, the less anti-doping ultimately. And now this is less of an issue about testing and more about disclosure. But I'm just pointing out, it's, that's really what you have to figure out when you're debating what the important um, move is here, is how much privacy do you want to give and how much leeway towards anti-doping. I would say this is one of the better ones because yeah. it doesn't affect their testing protocol. It doesn't affect their adjudication protocol. It's merely an announcement. Now, I will get sticky, and I, I absolutely take my hat off to Sean O'Malley, for getting out in front of it, for not hiding behind it, for declaring what it is. And by the way, look how much better it is. Yes. He gets to set the narrative. Exactly. He gets to go out and do it. And by the way, you could say, well, why should he be able to? Because they changed the policy for fully a third of these, a third of these yeah. being overturned. It is absolutely the right call. I applaud the UFC for doing it. I'm sure it was painful and debated and difficult. But the athletes are entitled to some protections. I'm glad they gave them some. Yeah. This should have been done from the very beginning. Um, it, I mean, sure, the announcement is still going to be the same. Like, you know, the, uh, the fighter cannot compete. Like, O'Malley can't compete at UFC 29, right? That, that That's a fact. Uh, but he gets to go out there and, and, and say it himself. And I, th I think that's huge because as soon as this you, these USADA headlines come out, uh, you know, potentially flagged for you know anti-doping uh you know failed tests whatever like immediately what people think is just oh steroids uh you know he, that person failed a a drug test when it can be like a number of things you know um and now with with this you know fighters get to first of all think you know what, what, what's you know how's the best way to process this and uh you know really uh you know take on the situation with with honesty and and and, and you know, present their case out there to the public, right? Yep. All right, well, look, you want to try and reach Mr. Musasi? Yeah, let's do it. So I'm going to reach out to him. Um, do you want me to leave a question for you? Sure. Or... Yeah, yeah, do that. That'd be okay. great. Mm -hmm. Cool. So here's a uh, Diaz Poirier question by a female caller. Oh, look at that. Got a lady calling. All right, how about yeah. that? Hi there, Luke. It's Joe here calling from Jolly Old England. And my question to you is, what do you think would happen if both Nate and Dustin turned up to the weigh-ins and both weighed in bang on 165? Would they have to scrap the card? Would they make it a catch weight? What do you think would happen? And do you think there should be a 165 pound division? Thanks. Bye. <sighs> <sighs> <laughs> You know what? It's a good caller right there. Uh, thank you so much. Shouts to jolly old England. Um, I don't think they would do that because, number one, they would just lose money. The UFC would find them both, um, and I don't think they're in the business of, of giving up cash. You, you can make the point that they would try to make some point together, and if the two canceled out the punishment by them both being on weight that way or off weight, then maybe that'd be different, but the punishments would be handed out irrespective of any of those uh, concerns. So, so no, I, I just don't find that very realistic. The one thing that's kind of interesting is, has anybody reached out to the New York Athletic Commission to see if they'd be sized for this? Um, I wonder if they would be in favor of it. Now, the Association of Boxing Commissions is prepared and I think has already passed uh, guidelines in uh, allowing for 165. But the, the bigger issue here would be um, to what extent uh, the New York Commission would be willing to accommodate this on short notice and uh, bumping up 170 ostensibly to 175. Would they keep any other? Let me look at the card here real quickly. UFC 230. Okay, yeah, Siri, I don't need to talk to you. Uh, who else is on that card? Let's see. Let's see. Let's see. 
You've got a welterweight fight with Lyman Good and Sultan Aliyev, and you've got, uh, that's it, and then some middleweight fights. So you do have the one welterweight fight. Would they bump that to 175? Would they just keep it at 170? Uh, hard to say. So part of this would just be a function of regulatory um, willingness. But uh, we'll have to wait and see. All right, look at this. This gentleman always treats us well. My God, did he not look impressive on Saturday night? Wow. He is the reigning middleweight champion and absolutely just bulldozed his last contender. Very good fighter coming up from another weight class. One of the best fighters to ever do it, certainly in that division. The uh, the champ is here, Gagard Musasi. Mr. Musasi, welcome back. I'm good. I'm good. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I know you're making time for us. You just landed in Amsterdam. I really appreciate that. Let me start by saying congratulations. And the first question, I suppose, would be, did that, that had to go about as easy as you thought it might go, right? Well, I thought the, in the interviews uh, before the fight, I said, or I can dominate him in two rounds, or it will be a hard-fought five-round fight. So, uh, but eventually, it's not an easy, but uh, it went... Uh, Better than uh, than um, than we thought. So, what were you expecting from him? Like worst case scenario, what was the game plan? The game plan was exactly what we did: uh, keep him uh, at the at range, uh, straight punches, uh, uh, more kicks, maybe uh, kicks to the body, but uh, uh, and make him desperate for him to shoot and take over. Because uh, I could have shot on him. At, Try to take him down, but we don't want to end up in a guillotine or anything, something like that. So we wanted him to come to us, and uh, that's what he did. I think he got punched a lot, and then he was a little bit desperate. And uh, so he went for my leg, and uh, that's how I get the top position. Yeah, and you noticed he didn't shoot. He went for that Iminari roll, but it, it didn't go very well. Are you surprised he went for that? It's fairly low percentage, right? Uh, yeah, I've seen him uh, do that against uh, Wonderboy Thompson, uh, but uh, I thought he's a southpaw, so it's easier to do that against a southpaw. I didn't think he would do that to me. But uh, obviously, I thought, uh, I've seen his tape, I studied him. Now, ultimately, you were able to get your left knee through, you walked his hips to the other side, and you were able to pass to mount, and it all went very quickly. I know, again, you believe in your ability, but it seemed to happen so fast. I wonder if even you were surprised by that. Uh, no, I think, uh, I don't know, when I hit him on the nose, uh, after that he was uh, defending. Uh, even from the guard, I was hitting him. Those, I don't know if, if people can see it on camera, but those were hard punches, hard elbows. So eventually he opened his guard, and that's why I got to pass his guard and I got to full mount. Uh, so I was actually hurting him uh, in, uh, when I was uh, in, uh, in his guard. How much do you think size played a role? Uh, I always said uh, size doesn't matter. If, if he would clinch or I would get a top position, then size would definitely matter. And I think that was the case here. Uh, I always said I'm faster than him. He was thinking that he was fast, but I was faster than him. Uh, I had the better stand-up than um, yeah, size play the factor. But before people go on size thing, uh, GSP fought this thing he won. Kevin Gaslam is fighting for the middleweight title. He's a welterweight. Uh, Whitaker himself was a welterweight. Uh, you know, it, so before people go and say, yeah, well, it was size difference. Oh, 100% it made a difference when, when we were on the ground. But I think um, stand up, I was better and my game plan was better. Where do you think this puts you among middleweights in the world? I really don't care. I, I, you know, uh, my goal was never to be the best. or uh, I always wanted to make my money. Uh, of course, I always wanted to win my fight. Um, but, of course, if you keep winning, people are going to say uh, the best middleweight and how I would face uh, against Whitaker or something like that. But to be honest, I really don't care. Fair enough. Now you. I don't even want to be considered the best because you know everyone loses, uh, you know, and then uh, and then uh, all the haters will come up, you know. <laughs> yeah, you're right. That's probably true. Uh, so what's interesting though is you broke some hearts, uh, Mr. Musasi, prior to the fight. I believe you said this that you know the end is coming, not not right away, of course, but it's not too far away. 
Um, when did you when did you decide that you were probably closer to retirement than some may have realized? Uh, definitely after Shimlenko fight. Uh, but after that fight, I stepped up. I'm, I feel like I'm a better fighter than uh, when I fought Shimlenko. But uh, um, yeah, and uh, it's almost two more fights. It's almost end of my contract, so. Uh, I have to see it. Like I said, I will never say it. Uh, I'm going to quit because, like I said, if I have wins like this where I don't take damage and I'm just uh, winning uh, without any damage, without any injuries, of course, I could see myself go another three fights. But uh, to be honest, I'm looking to see the, how the next three fights will go and then, uh, to be honest, to quit, yeah. Wow. So it was the uh, when your eye got all swollen up in the Shlomenko fight, you were just like... Fuck this! This is just too much injury. Well, people didn't see what happened back after the fight. I was in the hospital. I couldn't move. Uh, I didn't know if I lost my eye or not. You know, people didn't see those parts. Uh, so, and then uh, hearing all the crap uh, that I lost, but I didn't lost. And then uh, it is what it is. Uh, you know, uh, this is how the sport is. Uh, but I want to go on top. So. Uh, the way I'm training now, I train really hard. I can do it another three times. I don't know what kind of motivation I will have after that, but uh, training is hard. Uh, uh, training camp is really hard, so I'm not enjoying it. Yeah, so wait, let me break that down into two parts. Your eye, the only thing that we saw, of course, was it swell up, but you almost lost your eye. No, well, I, I didn't know because uh, the doctor, doctors were talking. Uh, my surgeon uh, that had operated my knee was there. My uh, my normal doctor that uh, always helped me with recovery after the weighing was there. Uh, my eyes were shut, uh, and then uh, they, they didn't know what was uh, wrong with my eyes. So for a long time, I was in the dark. So uh, we didn't know. Thank God, uh, no serious injuries to the eye. But uh, uh, yeah, if you have fights like that, you're gonna think health is more important. You know, uh, it's nice that I make money, but uh, um, I want to end up healthy. I don't want to be a retard after uh, three. <laughs> sure, I can understand that. Is that the worst injury you've had from a fight? Uh, yeah, yeah, so, yeah. Yeah. Now, what's interesting is the other yeah, thing normally, you. Yeah, Go ahead. I normally don't take any damage, and uh, but. Like I said, if you fight a hundred times, uh, eventually you're gonna see a punch that you're not gonna see, or you know it's gonna land on the wrong place, and that's what it that's what it happens. You know, it, it, it caught me in the first minutes, and uh, shit happens. Yeah, yeah, it certainly does. Um, <laughs> all right. The other thing you said was <laughs> yeah. just so you know, because the viewers are watching this. I, I personally, I don't care. But just for clarification's sake, uh, Gagard, retard is a bit of an impolite word. Did you know that? Oh, I didn't. No, I didn't know that. But, but you guys, you Americans are very sensitive, I have to say, also. You it's just, true, yeah. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to be, like, uh, brain damage, let's say. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. Look, you we, we are, are... very sensitive. American people are very sensitive. So. I know. I know. Look, you're right. We're way too sensitive. You don't have it's... those problems in Europe, uh, to be honest, uh, you guys have everything, uh, me too movement to, I don't know what kind of movements you guys have. Yeah, well, I'll leave that part alone. I'll just it's say not, we are I'm definitely not, too I'm sensitive. Not, I'm not, I'm not uh, but you guys are also feminists. I don't know. You just, uh, <laughs> all right, all right. Let's put that aside for just a second. Yeah. You mentioned, you mentioned that, uh, you don't, you don't enjoy training. Now, I can understand that, but, like, is it a case where you've never really liked training all that much and you just did it to get good or that you used to like it and now you have fallen out of love with it? Well, I never, after the, I lost and tried against Dono, I never felt the same. I didn't love the sport that much anymore, to be honest. I always have continued and uh, what's the fun of training? I, I don't sleep well. Uh, I, I I cannot eat well. Uh, I'm on diet. Uh, Every day people are punching me. Uh, my body is sore, uh, so I don't have a lot of fun. I, you know, I have to be. I can't go and uh, have fun. It's uh, so people think. Um, people think the fun about to be a fighter is not. I don't know. Uh, I can do a lot of fun stuff uh, if I don't fight. 
What would you do if you stopped fighting? Eat, uh, maybe travel. <laughs> what? Do you, what? And, uh, make beers or something like that. Yeah. What do you like to eat? What's the What's the go to now? Now that you're home back John in food, uh, Holland. Junk food, pizza, ice cream, chocolate, um, anything that's not good for you, I like. Yeah. Well, nothing wrong with that. But seriously, you haven't <laughs> thought about occupation, like what what you, what you would be if fighting ended. Uh, I thought about to do some charity work or something, but uh, I don't know. I'm just saying that, but uh, <laughs> maybe that to keep me busy or uh, help my fellow to to get a title, a uh, world title. Uh, so I, I haven't really th- thought about it, but uh, um, just, uh, you know, for the first year, I'm going to just go eat. I go uh, maybe, you know, get fat. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Uh, look, a few more questions for you. And I really appreciate your time. So you have what? Three more fights on your contract? Yes. All right. And I know that the uh, Leota Machida fight is important for you. He's got a big contest coming up in I think December, if I'm not mistaken. Let's say that yeah. that goes well for him or whatever. He can get through that without any issue. Do you anticipate that that's the next fight for you? No, because uh, it's fighting December. Uh, I talked to Scott. I said uh, Lovato's next. He's undefeated. Like. Six, uh, six and oh in uh, Dallas or something like that. Uh, he's the next number one contender. I would like to face him in January or something like that, and then fight Mashida afterwards if he wins his fight. But uh, I'm not gonna wait for Mashida for six months. The guy doesn't deserve that. Okay, fair enough. But you ultimately want to face him. Are you going to require that there's out of competition drug uh, testing for if you face him? Hundred percent. Yeah, yeah. Listen, I know the commission, uh, which state you're fighting, the commission handles that. But uh, they're going to have to get another party involved uh, to do extra additional testing. Otherwise, they can keep, I'm going to give the title back to him, and I'm not going to fight. So it's simple as that. Uh, uh, we don't want a 40-year-old guy uh, using steroids and feeling like 20. We want him as the 40-year-old guy that he is now, and uh, that, that guy I want to face. I don't want to... Uh, by the cheater. And he knows he's cheating. And he's, all the time he's now in interviews about saying stupid shit. But uh, uh, let's see how he shows up in his next fight. The reason that he left UFC, he got paid the same from Bellator. Uh, he got the same offer. UFC and Bellator, they, they paid him, I think, the same. And he went to Bellator because he just himself, he said, I, don't want, I didn't like the USADA testing. So I know what he's up to. So if it came to it, you wouldn't mind giving up the belt? I don't mind. They can have the belt. If they don't really drug test them, I don't, I'm not going to fight with that. Wow. Uh, and I, I would, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's easy to say. Do you, do you know what a bucket list is? Uh, well, my, yeah, yeah. I, uh, my goal now is Lovato, and if Mashida wins, uh, it's Mashida. And then uh, I have one fight left. And uh, I can make world to weight. I saw Dr. Fima cutting weight. I hugged the guy. I said, wow, you're a big guy, you know. <laughs> and uh, so, yeah, I can make world to weight. Easy. Not easy. It will be difficult, but I can make it. I talked to my doctor. It's possible for me. Or I go a uh, lighter weight. I fight Ryan Bader. But that's a dreaming. Uh, that's, uh, you know, uh, I have to go to Lovato and then uh, whoever is next. Yeah, that's crazy though. But so, if you could make welterweight, like, what was your walking around? What 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 do you weigh today, for example? Well, after the weighings, I was two hundred pounds. Um, uh, I think, uh, I think, uh, yeah, uh, the big welterweights are around uh, one hundred ninety. Uh, so, if I lose, uh, you know, 10, ten pounds more, something like that, I could make uh, one hundred seventy. Man, but you would hate that camp, though. You couldn't eat anything. Yeah, but uh, I would do it only for one time. You know, uh, it's only one time, and let's say I finish my contract with another title, and I uh, and I'm gone. Just uh, uh, as a, for accomplishment, I want to do that. You know. Yeah. And then uh, I, I'm not gonna do well to wait all my life. It's just one time deal. You know, if I I mentioned to Bellator that I can do it. But uh, only at the end of my career, uh, let's say last last fight or something like that, just to just to have that accomplishment, nothing else. 
By the way, have you spoken to him, the to Bellator either a about down the line this welterweight idea or about the extra party for the drug testing? Have you brought this up to them? Uh, yeah, yeah, but I understand uh, Bellator is uh, working with the commission uh, in which stage the fight is gonna be. Uh, but um, whenever the fight comes here, he still has to win from uh, Carvalho. So we have to see if he's gonna win. Uh, but I have to, you know, I'm going to look, I'm going to definitely have a close look at the fight. Um, listen, even if you, let's say, uh, we forget about the steroid. He, we say, I made a mistake, he didn't use steroid. But I fought him, I felt he was oiled up. I, I, I seen the footage that he was, that he was shiny. That, uh, that when I had his back, I uh, chimney down on him, uh, and he took a uh, position, a uh, top position. So, uh, you know, what can I say? Uh, that I felt. Let's say the steroid part, even I don't know 100%. We say, okay. that's uh, But the other part, I know 100%. So, at least uh, this, this time he's not going to be in Brazil. I'm not the same fighter coming out of injury. Uh, he's not the same fighter either. And... Uh, the result will be definitely different, and there's a little bit bad blood. I love that because uh, it's only going to motivate me to train better. You know. Well, I got to say, you looked phenomenal uh, on Saturday. You made it you made it look easy, and that's not an easy thing to do. By the way, before you go, um, who's your prediction for Champions League winner this year? It's Madrid again, right? Yeah, I don't like Real Madrid uh, anyway, but uh, now they let uh, they let Ronaldo go. I think uh, I don't like them to win at all. You know what? You're now my mortal enemy, Mr. Musasi. We can Why? no longer... Because but, you know you love Madrid. Stop lying on the air. Tell the truth. Oh, come on. Let, okay, okay. But uh, why did they uh, let uh, Ronaldo go? He's the best player. One of the... Uh, if not... If Messi is not the best, he's the best. You know, uh, they let the best player go for $100 million. Uh, they won the Champions League three times in a row. They sh- I feel like Real should have, you know, kept him, not let him go. Because uh, what I've seen from Barcelona players, uh, they usually don't let them go. Or when they go, they retire, you know. Uh, Neymar, so Neymar I, went to PSG. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm talking about like uh, Iniesta. I'm talking about like Messi. Yeah. I'm talking about those guys that came up with uh, uh, Bellator. Uh, I, 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 but the Barcelona's youth, yeah. you know, the youth yeah. team. So I feel like they didn't treat them well. well look, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not a Ronaldo fan, by the way, but uh, I don't know. That's my sure sounds like it. Know. I'll tell you what, when Madrid win again, you can come on the show and apologize to me, okay? And they're not going to win this year. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry yeah. was, uh, all right. Well, look, congratulations. Ronaldo, you did a, yeah. Yeah. Thank All you. right. All right. All right. Enough. Uh, congratulations, Gagarin. I really appreciate your time. And again, man, what a win for you. You looked unbelievable. And uh, enjoy the junk food, okay? Thank you, my friend. Thank you. <laughs> All right. There he goes. Oh, he is a character. He's a character. He's a good one. All right, guys, don't forget, number to call, as always, 844-866-2468. Congrats to the winners. Use the hashtag the MMA Hour whenever you uh, talk about us and whenever you got a question for us. Send that, and I believe it is uh, the MMA Hour at VoxMedia.com for folks who want to send in a recorded voicemail, which we can get to next week. Uh, if you see me in Vegas, say hi. Don't be weird. We'll be back next Monday. Thank you guys so much for watching. Until then, stay frosty.